researchers and we provide information on the R&D systems. The forum is our biannual flagship event for thematic dialogue between international stakeholders. And there we focus on ongoing and current research topics, but also on topics which are high on the political agenda of the government of India and Germany. Reducing the output of greenhouse gas emissions is one of the most critical responses to climate change. And in this context, urban mobility plays a significant role. Already today, cities account for 60 to 80 percent of energy consumption and at least 70 percent of carbon emissions, and there the transportation sector plays a, a major role. Furthermore, it's estimated that by 2015, about 68 percent of the world population will be living in urban areas. One of the challenges arising from such rapid urbanization is the amplifying impact of cities and urban mobility on climate change, and that's why we're focusing uh, on this topic today. For decades, the mobility and the energy sector operated independently uh, focused pr and had a focus primarily on technology approaches. But changes towards sustainable urban mobility will only succeed if technological development from different fields are integrated and the interplay between technological development and societal mobility needs and is understood and taken into account. The topic of climate change is high on the political agenda. India committed at the COP26 in Glasgow to net zero emissions by 2070 and declared to source 50% uh, energy requirements from renewables by 2023. So India's energy transition is rapidly underway and I think we will take that up in the, uh, in the uh, talk which we're going to have after the opening. Carbon neutrality by 2045 and 80% of renewable power share by 2030 are the targets set by the German government. And the German government has a research agenda, sustainable urban mobility, and there is a lot of funding at the moment going into these topics. But also the need for international cooperation in these fields has been highlighted. During the Indo-German governmental consultations last year, key topics for future cooperation in science and research have been agreed, amongst them energy transition, renewable energies, sustainable urban development, and green mobility. And currently India is leading the G20 group and topics on the agenda are climate and environment, clean energy for a greener future, materials for sustainable energy, and eco-innovations for energy transition. So you see the very good match and you see that this uh, conference is coming uh, uh, just due in time. But also strengthening and promoting innovation through richer collaboration is on the agenda of G20. So climate change, and that's what we all know, doesn't stop at borders, and no country alone will solve the future challenges. For reaching the set goals, research is instrumental, and international cooperation in research is key to ensure a green and sustainable development. And I think and I hope that we enhance this discussion uh, with the forum today. Against this backdrop, we organize the forum and discuss urban future mobility, focusing on the mobility energy nexus from an interdisciplinary perspective. In our two-day hybrid event, we bring together researchers, decision makers, and professionals from India, Germany, but also Sweden and Egypt. The 32 speakers which we have lined up will present research projects across disciplines and analysis on sustainable solutions and technologies for sustainable urban mobility. So I invite you to join today here on site, but also online, the seven sessions. Today we will focus on the energy transition and the role of urban mobility. And in a second panel today, five early career researchers will discuss future solutions for urban mobility. They have been discussing over the last three days together uh, in a design thinking process with other 20 researchers uh, and have developed new ideas. And I think we've got a glimpse of this workshop also today on the panel. Tomorrow, international experts will address agendas and policies for urban mobility focusing on megacities. We will discuss integrated mobility and energy models for cities give an outlook on the role of artificial intelligence for future solutions for energy and mobility, and we also will look into new business models, energy markets, and the technology adaptation and diffusion uh, tomorrow. All the sessions tomorrow will take place online, and I'm glad that we managed to get a lot of German speakers on board, so tomorrow is the day online to interact um, and uh, with the speakers uh, 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 online and uh, yeah, to interact with the panels. As the Indo-German Forum is a platform for interdisciplinary exchange and network, uh, and uh, 
um, we would like to provide you the opportunity of networking. We do this, of course, today. Uh, we invite also all the people who are registered online to the platform. You have the possibility there to network, to exchange chats, but you can also um, have even one-to-one -one meetings with the other participants on the platform. More than 400 people registered online for the event, and uh, I would really like to encourage you to use the platform, and we all know that we are very busy these days. The platform will be open for one more month, so there is a possibility after the conference to go through the profiles and to touch base with people. Within the Indo-German Forum, we are offering a platform thematic exchange, but exchange and cooperation does not stop at one event and is continuously ongoing. And as one of our goals is to facilitate cooperation by connecting researchers, but also offering information and expertise in international cooperation, I'm very glad to announce that we launched today Connecting a Portal for Indo-German Research Cooperation. The portal aims to offer a broad overview of funding opportunities for research projects, past and ongoing cooperation projects, and ongoing Indo-German events. So what is so special about the new platform? You have the opportunity to connect via the portal to funding agencies and to DPIs directly in a, a data secured manner, of course. And furthermore, you can share your information about your Indo-German research projects and upload your content. So it's quite interactive and it's more of a community platform, I would say. The information offer will be growing over hopefully over the next couple of months. And I'm uh, really cl uh, glad um, uh, that we can open that portal to give an overview and bring the scattered information on the Indo-German cooperation together in one platform. My thanks today go to all the participating speakers and institutions who are joining us and especially to my DVH team who put a lot of effort to build up the Indo-German Forum. I wish you an interesting morning for those who are joining the stream uh, online from Germany, afternoon, and good and informative talks and discussions. And I hope to see you and meet you also tomorrow virtually and in the audience of the panel discussions. Thanks. <laughs> and I would now over, uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Ackermann, Ambassador of the Republic of Germany. Thank you very much. And let me start by saying uh, or extending my greetings to all participants. A warm welcome to India to those who came from Germany and greetings also to those who dialed in digitally. Um, I see some familiar faces. I've met some of you on Monday already. Um, the opening of the design thinking workshop on energy and mobility and I hope you have come up with some new ideas. I know that this workshop was very interesting and because it was a bit of an out of the box thinking workshop that I'm still waiting for. Oh, I'm, I'm waiting for, for some brilliant ideas from your, um, your side. Um, but uh, sustainable urban mobility is a subject that is basically concerning us all. I will tell you, I will share with you that I was in Mumbai two weeks ago and um, uh, I've, it felt like um, I was, um, maybe you can shut the door, sir. That would be very nice because um, it's very noisy coming out. Please. <laughs> So two weeks ago I was in M Mumbai um, and I know uh, that many of you know the, the, the city and its challenges, um, but it might not surprise you that I probably m spend more time in the car than in my hotel room and all the meetings together actually. And that's not a state of things that we should uh, tolerate. Um, so basically I'm eagerly awaiting your creative solutions to the challenges of urban mobility. But, and I have to say that um, uh, that also concerns, or the topic concerns as much India as it does German cities, um, where the challenge of mobility is rather invisible, but massive in its consequences, namely the, two, uh, the CO2 emissions that mobility is creating. So we know that mobility means ex access to education, to jobs, to health, to community services, and I think we all um, are convinced by the fact that we need technical innovations, but we also have to balance out the societal and political dimensions and trade-offs to improve urban mobility. So I salute that you are not only approaching the topic from a technical, but from such a comprehensive perspective. So Germany is contributing to India's urban mobility through the Green Urban Mobility Partnership. And now, listen to that, it's called GUMP. 
like Forrest Gump. I, I admire all signs, the signs and academia, they love these acronyms and you know, I'm completely lost in them. I, uh, but Gump is a nice one actually. So uh, we, pledged, uh, we pledged a loan of a billion euros from 2019 to 2023 to develop energy efficient em and emission reduced solutions for mobility. This program focuses on e-mobility, on public transport by bus, train and subway, on non-motorized mobility such as bikes and pedestrians, and on e-rickshaws and bike sharing. One of the key innovations in sustainable urban mobility are electric vehicles. We know, we everybody knows that. Um, with fewer moving parts than internal combustion engines, they are easy to manufacture as well as maintain. And India has a unique market where there is a huge demand for two and three wheeler electric vehicles. You should know that 75% of Indian mobility in cities is done with two or three wheelers, 75%, it's enormous. Um, electric auto rickshaws are available at a fraction of the price of a petrol rickshaw. There is scope for innovation in the area of battery technology, for example, that can increase the battery capacity and reduce the charging time. So when the Chancellor was here two weeks ago, we went to a company that, um, uh, called is that's called Sun Mobility in Bangalore, where they have a very intelligent way of a battery swap, swap uh, system in Bangalore. Transfer was very impressed, and 25% um, uh, of this um, company is um, owned by Bosch, by a German, uh, big German uh, giant, industrial giant. And uh, that's, I felt, and the Chancellor was of this opinion too, um, that this is... Um, can we maybe close the doors? I'm, I mean, I love music and stuff, but it's a, <laughs> it's a bit of a disturbance. Um, um, so the transfer was quite fascinated by, uh, by this because it is a kind of a, um, um, a innovation that you know, might be used in, in, in many, many um, circumstances also in Europe. Um, and it, it is a system that works perfectly well, actually. So um, in addition to techno technolo uh, technological innovations, we are also seeing many new business models and policy initiatives that are helping to drive sustainable urban mobility. For example, ride sharing and car sharing services are becoming increasingly popular, providing people with more convenient and cost effective ways to get around cities. While we focus on building newer technologies, we must also focus on increasing the access to these, the access to these technologies. EVs won't be profitable without an extensive charging infrastructure to back them up. So, but what, what is, is important in India is also to create spaces for alternative um, traffic. Um, and I think uh, all of you know, know Delhi and Mumbai, that there is um, an urgent need for, let's say, cycling paths or, or, or lanes for two-wheelers in general. And we hosted, the embassy hosted a, a bike ride last Sunday called the Cycling for Life a bike ride, uh, which underlined the need to create bike-friendly zones in cities and bike-friendly infrastructure. It is very clear that, you know, people who ride bikes in India are mostly poor people. Um, um, they can't afford even a rickshaw. And therefore, um, they are, you know, in traffic, it is very dangerous for them in, in, in Delhi. So we, we in Delhi and other cities, so we, I think the, the first steps have been taken by the, by the administration, but we should also look to it that um, this has, has to become better. In a way. Um, we have um, made experience in Europe with cycling paths um, in, in many European capitals. Um, some are better than others, um, but, but it's, it's a new mobility that one should not be underestimated. So I can tell you that I have, uh, I have been spending the last six uh, years of my life in Berlin um, as the director general for this, the Global South um, in the in the foreign f and federal foreign office, and I don't have a car, and I was moving across the city on a bike, yeah, on a bicycle. Um, and if um, the infrastructure wasn't there, I think it would have been much more difficult. Um, but now in Berlin, also you have quite a good um, bicycle infrastructure. Um, the Indo-German Science and Technologies Partnership is exemplary and I'm quite sure that it will contribute to solve these challenges with important contributions. And I wish you here a fruitful exchange, manifold new experiences 
and I'm looking forward to hearing about the new research ideas and proposals that will come out of this conference. I wish you a fruitful day and a half or two days basically um, and um, I hope you will have a, a very good and very innovative and creative meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ackerman, for joining us today and also on Monday. Thanks a lot also for highlighting the initiatives from Germany. The project that he spoke about, the GUMP project, will also be a part of the forum tomorrow. So those who have uh, registered, you will hear from, from the heads of the project talking largely about the governance issues in India and Germany. Um, we need a minute here now to set up for the next panel and then we are ready to go with the keynote session. So I will wait while someone helps out in that. While the setup is being finished, I would ask the panelists to come on stage, please, so that when we introduce, people know who's who. No, you can keep it. So in this opening session, uh, which is going to be on the energy transition and role of sustainability in, mobi in urban mobility, um, we're going to hear about the current energy transitions in India and Germany, and uh, we will also know uh, about the global trends and challenges in energy transition, and we will get some international perspectives. So for the panel, I have here the, I will go from the session chair, we have here Mr. Uh, Pavan Muluk Mulukutla, yeah. is that right? Thanks. Uh, Pavan Mulukutla, who is the director of the Integrated Transport and Electric Mobility and Hydrogen at World Resources Institute India. He um, has over two decades of professional experience working in intersectionality of urban mobility, energy, and environment, and is responsible um, for the strategic direction and implementing um, overarching programs in these topics, which I mentioned at WRI. He is um, also leading India's knowledge support for the development of National Green Hydrogen Mission uh, lately, which is uh, announced by the MNRE. And uh, you will also find him writing regularly in the leading media in India. So thank you so much, Pavan, for joining us. Then we have for speakers, uh, Professor Miranda Scheuers from the Technical University of Munich, um, who is the chair of the Climate and Environment Policy at uh, the Bavarian School of Public Policy um, and uh, at, at the... That was me, I'm back. Um, yeah, she investigates environmental movements, green politics, climate policy, making more comparative um, analysis, and she has a lot of international projects ongoing. And uh, her special credits are that she was appointed as a member of the German Ethics Commission on Safe Energy Supply by Chancellor Angela Merkel. And in the past years, she was also a member of the German Advisory Council on Environment and is also currently the chair of the European Environment and Sustainable Development Advisory Councils. So thank you so much, Miranda, for joining us and coming all the way from Germany for this panel. Thank you. Now we have Shipra, Shipra Mishra, who is the CEO and Managing Director of 
um, DRIIV, which is the Delhi Research Implementation and Innovation, which is the cluster in Delhi, science and technology cluster, uh, initiated by the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. From her background, she's a materials and metallurgy scientist, engineer, and uh, is trained management professional. Prior to this, she has 20 years of experience uh, of leadership and entrepreneurship in Fortune 500 companies and uh, working with large financial institutions as well. So thank you so much, Shipra. Now I hand it over to you, Pawan, for the deliberations. You have an hour. Thanks. Just making sure. Um, a warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think very interesting times, right? We are in the middle of this whole energy transition, and we've been talking about um, electric mobility. We have been talking about hydrogen and how this is going to really transform and um, not only the way we move and live, but also um, it's going to impact so many aspects of from urban planning, the way our cities are going to be designed to the way uh, from the geopolitics to the security aspects to how countries are also striving to really lead innovation and also frame policies. We have seen huge investments. Just giving Indian context, I think all of you know, the National Green Hydrogen Mission was announced almost close to 20,000 crores, which will really focus on um, the uh, local manufacturing of electrolyzers in India. It will also focus on specific projects in India related to different sectors and also certain pilots and policies. EVs, we all know, so I'm not going to repeat. We have heard of fame policies. We have heard about so many states actually uh, setting their own ambitions. And um, also targeting jobs and creating manufacturing bases, right? So there is whole of this conversation in India. And I think Germany also, there's this whole partnership which has been supporting this energy transition and lot to learn and exchange from each other. Before I jump asking you all for the next 45, 50 minutes, I thought for a change, why don't we ask the audience, what are some of the questions or thoughts actually they have? It's the afternoon. It's very difficult to make you all listen here. So I just thought, are there some specific areas do you think you would like to understand? you have any specific questions so that you know, then our panelists would be extremely well prepared to really cater to that. So I'll just walk around so that I'll wake you all up <laughs> and I'll also be awake. Nice. Thank you for volunteering. Do we have another mic? Yeah, yeah, please. Can you please pass around? Thank you. If you can introduce yourself. So we'll take three, four questions, and then I'll move to the panel. Thank you. OK, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm Daniel from uh, Germany, computer scientist. Uh, I recently read that when all the countries will now start racing towards the energy transition, towards sustainable uh, means, that there will be like a global bottleneck with respect to resources and manpower and stuff. Is that currently part of the uh, of the research? Because we have, I think, in Germany, we have very ambitious goals. But if, like, the states and all the other countries try to achieve the same, will we all end up not achieving them, or where is it going? Excellent. I think global bottleneck related to resources, to human capital, and everything. That's the question you have, sir. If you could introduce, can I get the mic here, please? Thank you. So that's the question you could. Uh, this is this is Alok Srivastav. I'm, I've come from Chandigarh, Punjab University. I'd heard Shipra just last week. Okay, uh, so my question is now we are talking about sustainable from the point of view of developed countries, a different issue, but from our point of view, I'm thinking about my country. The problem which I foresee is that we talk about sustainability for that, you know, we are using vehicles. But, and then you are saying, like the uh, Ambassador Ackerman also said, we are using two wheelers, they're all electric vehicles, electric vehicles. I just wanted to bring to your notice that these electric vehicles are actually deriving energy which has been produced by coal powered stations. So it is, is it really helping us to achieve this sustainability? Yeah. So this is the issue which you could, from sure. the developing country's point I of I think we'll talk, yeah. touch upon it in the yeah, energy if transition. It, if it's point. possible, that would be nice. Excellent, sir. One last question. Yes, sir. Oh. 
Thank you, Ingo Liefner, uh, Leibniz University, Hanover. Uh, my question would be, since, since we have a mixed audience, German and Indian, what is the extra value added that we can raise or expect from uh, working and thinking and talking and blending Indian and German perspectives in this field? Excellent. So blending is the theme here. That's what I take. So I'll start, Miranda, with you. I think uh, we're comfortable with this set of questions for now, and then we'll come back to you all, and then we will ask our expert panelists on how they view this. Miranda, can you just touch upon what are some of the global trends that you're seeing in this transition? And I think there's a fair bit of questions that have been raised around, are we competing with e each other, or are we really complementing? And how would we really even blend these partnerships, right, if I may use that word? So uh, over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much uh, also for the questions from the audience. Um, maybe I'm going to take one step back first and um, point out that yesterday the International um, Panel on Climate Change um, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with a sixth assessment report. And it's basically a report that is screaming for action because it's really raising awareness of how serious the growth in greenhouse gas emissions is for temperature change, and not only temperature change, but all of the other factors that come with that. So rising sea levels, uh, storms, floods, droughts, 50% uh, of the world's population is already facing water scarcity issues. Um, and we still have a population growth globally that we need to take account of. So um, I think the, the background of all of our discussion needs to be we're not doing this simply because it's a fun exercise. We're doing it because it is totally necessary for all of our futures. And uh, we also know that um, the countries that are less developed will be impacted the worst. And therefore, um, planning now makes a, a very important contribution for mitigating against the worst and adapting to the worst um, uh, potentials and trying to limit how bad that worst is. Um, what we really want to do is reduce our greenhouse gas emissions drastically in a very short period of time. So you probably also know that India has set a climate neutrality target for 2070, and the European Union for 2050, and Germany for 2045, and the IPCC says it's not enough. The rich countries need to be doing 2040 for climate neutrality, which means that for India, 2070 will be too late too. Maybe India will need to do climate neutrality by 2060. 2055. And that's thinking that we haven't yet introduced into our policy thinking or into our planning or into our industrial activities, but it's going to have to happen, and that's why we need everybody on board thinking about this. Um, so that's the scary side of things. The exciting thing is that this means everything gets to change. And I always like to say nobody likes to do things the way their parents did. You want to do something new and different and, and um, innovate. And, and I think this is the opportunity we have right now. We have the opportunity to rethink what we've done in the past and to do things better. And why mobility is such an important part of that is because um, mobility is central to our economies. We cannot function without mobility. So we know we need to be thinking about mobility. We also know that mobility is causing a lot of problems. We heard the ambassador um, say that he's, he was stuck in traffic the whole time. How much economic loss do we have because people are spending their time stuck in traffic on a daily basis? Um, air quality. Um, it's actually been pretty good in Delhi here now, <laughs> but I've been here when it's not so good. And certainly transport is playing a big role in that. Um, and we have other areas. Uh, globally, um, emissions from um, airplane use are increasing because, of course, demand for, for that kind of travel is increasing. Yeah, we had a little bit of a reduction in the corona years, but it's coming back very rapidly. 
So we need to rethink um, a lot of what we do about transport. Now, one way of doing it is to simply say, let's transition from um, um, the conventional automobile to a electric. But that doesn't actually solve a lot of the problems, and it creates some new ones. So, um, you know, the new, the new ones, what are we doing with all the batteries that will be produced? They'll all have to be recycled. Um, um, you're still going to have uh, traffic jams everywhere. You're going to have billions more people who also want to have um, transport. So we can't just go from that old model to a new model. We need to think more creatively. And we need to think about how can we redesign transport so that it is more people-oriented. Why do we all want to avoid each other? I mean, it's kind of crazy. Rather than thinking of each other as a community, everybody gets into their private car and says, I don't want anything to do with you, and I'll just honk at you all the time. So how about if we think about making public transport something that's actually attractive, where you can get from point A to point B faster because you're in public transport. But it, of course, has to be safe, and it has to be comfortable. What could we do to redesign our cities so we don't have to move so far? Maybe all of those trips you're taking, maybe at least some of them could be reduced if we planned our cities a little bit better. And we heard about the potential for thinking about alternative modes of transport. I love coming to India. I love going for walks. And I go for walks here, and everybody's like, why are you walking? <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? you is it safe? Um, and I think in some senses we also need some cultural change. We need to get back to, we all used to walk, right? I mean, humans walk. Um, bicycles were a big invention. Um, maybe we need to find ways to make that also more comfortable and attractive. Um, and I'll, I'll have more to say, but I don't want to spend too, too much time talking, so. Yeah. No, thank you, Miranda. I think very interesting points, right? For me, two take takeaways. One is... How do we address the urban form? Because basically we're talking really about how do we plan our cities? Are we talking about compact cities? Are we talking about cities built on transit-oriented development? Like we have transit, but we are adjacent to transit, not using it sometimes, right? How do you ensure that a lot more people are walking, are cycling, and are using are into public transportation? So I think a combination of public transport and active mobility combined with urban form is what I heard from you, and I'm going to get back with a lot of questions that I have, because you spoke about a lot of opportunities and what we can do, and I would really like to hear that. But Shipra, let me bring you in. I mean, you have been uh, heading this uh, drive, which sounds very interesting, because we're all the time talking about avoiding driving. <laughs> and, but this drive is very different, which is around uh, the whole implementation and innovation. So I would really request if you could talk about what actually DRIVE does and what is the cluster program that you're heading looks into it and then I'll have follow-up questions. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, am I audible? Hello. Hello. Ready? Hello. Um, thank you so much, Pavan, and it was so interesting uh, listening to you, uh, Miranda. And uh, I mean, fantastically, you've covered all aspects, not just focusing and limiting on mobility, but also, you know, touching upon town planning, how we should think as, as individuals in terms of approaching this problem holistically. Um, taking a step back and coming to your question, Pavan. So DRIVE, it stands for Delhi Research, Implementation, and Innovation. It's a science and technology cluster, which was conceded by the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. And uh, the cluster concept is fairly well established in Germany, 20, 30 years, uh, you know, it dates back. In India, it's fairly new, so we are one and a half years old. And, uh, but the idea is exactly the same, to bring together industry, academia, and government bodies and take innovations from lab to market. We are headquartered at IIT Delhi, which is a nodal uh, organization. Um, all the other premier research institutes, uh, AIMS, CSIR labs, are part of the cluster. 
Uh, we also work very uh, heavily with corporates, public sector units, startups, and SMEs to engage and facilitate innovations uh, and help commercialize them. Now, in terms of our focus areas, uh, thematic areas are all aligned with national missions. Most of them to do with sustainability, which is very topical. So we cover renewable energy, waste to wealth, water security, air pollution mitigation, and also sustainable mobility, so e-mobility. Um, and we wrap it all up and involve uh, our other educational institutions like schools and colleges as part of the, uh, the effective education theme for the inquiry. So that's a quick update on REC. Just following up on that, um, what kind of innovations have you seen in this whole EV space? And um, yeah, why don't we start with that? So uh, as I said, uh, EVs are one of our key thematic areas. And uh, CART Lab, which is headquartered uh, in uh, IIT Delhi, it's Center for uh, Automotive Research and Propology. Uh, there, uh, we have worked with the researchers, Dr. Parikrahi, uh, who's uh, leading the lab. He engages with a number of startups and uh, PSUs to innovate in this space and take products from lab to market. I'll give you a few examples. So we have developed a number of uh, chargers, a whole suite of chargers, ranging from two-wheelers to three-wheelers. Earlier we heard that two, three-wheelers form 75% of our EV demand as of now. So two-wheelers, three-wheelers, four-wheelers, fast chargers, AC type two chargers, onboard chargers. And those chargers are now uh, being commercialized through combination of startups and PSUs, so EVI technologies in our ecosystem, uh, and uh, through their collaboration with HPCL and IPCL, they've already, uh, you know, set up, uh, you know, three more than 380 charging infrastructure across 17 cities and highways, and many more are being planned. Um, that is one. Then uh, we have worked a lot on uh, charging infrastructure management system because uh, the chargers need to interact with the grid. And so we need smart management systems to manage that. So we've partnered with Tata Power DDSL, and uh, we have uh, kind of piloted uh, one such project, along with a battery swapping station as well, uh, in a couple of areas in Delhi, uh, in Janakpuri, uh, for instance, and Rani Bagh. Uh, then uh, we have also uh, developed apps, Android apps, through these startups who engage with the uh, charging infrastructure activities so that people find it easy to locate chargers uh, wherever they are. So these are the existing innovations that have already uh, been commercialized. Other things that we are working on, as you know, charging infrastructure or lack of a charging infra infrastructure as of now is a huge challenge uh, you know, when it comes to scaling up e-mobility in India. And one of the problems, there are several problems with it, but one of the problems revolves around uh, technological hurdle. So every OEM has their own kind of design for a charging station, right? Which means that the charging uh, stations are not interoperable and therefore cannot be scaled up and becomes very expensive. So again, our team of experts, and uh, it's a consortium uh, across I various IITs, we are working on a common design uh, which w of a universal charger, which will make charging infrastructure interoperable, and therefore business models will become is easier to develop mm -hmm. along those lines. This is one. Then another aspect of it is vehicle to grid or vehicle to X. So we touched upon the holistic renewable energy concept also, and one of the key, in key ingredients of renewable energy is uh, battery storage. So why not also use the EV batteries as a storage system, particularly in areas which are hard to reach and obviously where the electricity grid is non-existent right now, like remote rural places. There we do have two wheelers going, right? So again, researchers are working on vehicle two, X, uh, you know, X could be anything, your home consumption, your grid, whatever, yeah? Then third element is currently in the motors, we still rely heavily on rare earth materials, right? 
So again, there is a focus on how to do away with rare earth materials and look for other more uh, proliferant materials to bring that. So these are some of the innovations that we are currently working on. No, thank you so much. I think quite interesting in talking into the, like getting into the nitty gritties of you know where the innovation is really needed and where it's really making a difference. Um, Miranda, let me just come back to the opportunities that you were talking about, where the opportunities lies, that one question. And then I also would request if you could comment on the first question that we heard, that are we competing? And I also would like to add one question from my end, are we doing enough? Thank you. I can answer that last question um, very easily. No, we're not doing enough. Um, and we all know that. And that's also why we're here, because we're trying to figure out how we can do more. Um, and um, I think it's, it's useful for us to ask, what's the added advantage of having Germany and India in the room together here? Um, we also know that the G20 is ongoing, and that, I think, is the first answer to this question. Germany and India are two of the biggest economies in the world, and that means that Germany and India are also watched by the rest of the world, and therefore what happens in our economies will send signals to the rest of the world about what the possibilities are. Um, so I'd say that's a first important perspective. I think a second important perspective is that Germany and India are two rather different countries. Germany is the size of an Indian state. Um, actually, Delhi, three Delhis is the size of the German population, right? So we have a very big populated country in India. We have a much less populated country in Germany. And that means that you have very different challenges. So working together, we get to cover a lot of different types of countries in terms of the challenges that are being faced. Everything from the, the crazy crowdedness of, of the Delhi roads or the Calcutta roads um, to um, the German highways where they haven't yet put speed limits in, right? So we have very, very different um, uh, challenges, but at the same time, out of those challenges, we can think about how do you develop systems that can be used everywhere? So um, I think that's another real opportunity. Then you get the question of technological um, complementarities. And I think here there's a lot of potential. Germany has a much longer tradition with, with um, uh, certain kinds of uh, vehicle transport. Um, India's rapidly moving into this field. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for partnerships. We've already heard about the partnerships going on in the battery area. Well, let's think about partnerships in terms of um, um, smart technologies. Let's think about partnerships that lead us to think intersectorally. Um, I think what you were just mentioning now is super, super important. The last thing we should be doing is thinking, here's the mobility transition, here's the energy transition, here's the water transition. They're all interrelated, and therefore we need to be thinking about how these sectors can best work together. Um, if we can make um, uh, our cities designed in such a way that we are thinking about smart energy in our homes and in our apartment buildings and in our office buildings, we can link that into the question of the mobility transition because that infrastructure has not yet been built, neither in Germany nor in India. And so one of the areas we can also think about are what are the solutions for integrating the new infrastructure we will need for um, uh, charging stations, for, for battery exchange, um, um, for linking into smart home technologies, and I think there's a lot of potential here as well. We also have the reality that Germany's population, it hasn't yet declined, but it will be declining, and India's population is continuing to grow which also means that there's complementarities here as well. We already have an awful lot of Indian students coming to Germany to study, and it wouldn't surprise me in, in, in the future we will have even more, that this is another area in education where we can do a lot together. Um, we had an interesting question here about um, what is the 
um, challenge associated with the energy transition if we go to electric vehicles, but our electricity is still being produced from fossil fuels. That's still true in Germany as well. Um, uh, in, in the German context, um, until about 2018, we were still getting 43% of our electricity from coal. Today, it's much lower. It's, it's 20, I don't know exactly, 25, 28%. Um, so the, the coal dependency has gone down tremendously, in part because of energy savings, energy efficiency, but primarily the growth of renewables. So very, very strong push on expansion of solar, offshore wind, wind. And this is an area where India is also doing a tremendous amount of um, transition. Um, India has some of the world's most ambitious solar power development um, plans. Um, and uh, it's not yet number one in the world. China's actually number one in the world in terms of capacity development. But I can imagine that India will catch up very quickly. So here, too, we can start thinking about how do we quickly get away from the fossil fuel dependency by expanding renewables? And that also means thinking about where you invest your money, not investing in new coal-fired power plants, but instead investing your money into um, um, alternative renewable technologies. So um, I think there's a lot of um, uh, potential, but the, the bottlenecks are there, and I'll make this my last set of comments for now. Um, the reason I think you can still have some hope and not think the world is going to end tomorrow is precisely because the competition is beginning. It's not just beginning. The race is on. I mean, um, it's a wrong analogy to use, but people are pressing on the electricity pedal. Um, and they're doing it because the big economies and the transitioning economies all know that the old model is on its way out. Um, the future is not going to be in coal-fired power plants. The future is not going to be in conventional engines. The future is going to be in hydrogen fuels and electric um, uh, technologies. And as a result, you can already see the shifts going on. The investment is starting to shift. And the policy makers will soon be the ones trying to catch up with industry rather than the other way around. So um, yes, um, there will be bottlenecks, but in a way we should be happy about that because it means the competition is happening. And that means that governments are gonna have to think about how do we start educating more people to be trained in thinking about how do you do solar roofs, how do you make conventional battery or, uh, electric batteries, how do you do charging stations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's going to be a fun decade. Um, can I add to that? So, um, I mean, brilliant summary of, you know, what, what is happening and what should happen. Just adding to that, the Indian aspect of renewable energy, uh, which Miranda mentioned. So, um, as you know, we have this target of net zero by 2070, but we are, uh, you know, heading with a lot of speed in that direction, and we do hope to bring it forward. Uh, so by 2047, we aim to be um, energy self-sufficient, so we don't have to import. What that means is when we add new capacity, that will all be renewable, right? And because of the solar transition and the wind transition that has already happened in India, it's much cheaper to set up a renewable energy plant versus a coal-based, versus a fossil fuel-based. So henceforth, whatever energy capacity is being added, will all be renewable. So a more ambitious target towards that is 2030, when uh, the government is trying to add 500 gigawatts of energy capacity, and this will constitute 50% of renewal, renewable energy. And that is one. Then in terms of green hydrogen, as you know, uh, you know it so well, so the government has set aside 20,000 crore of uh, you know, funds towards that. And uh, recently, uh, you know, DSD Department of Science and Education has uh, launched a call, and there is a vision to have a phased approach towards implementation, right? Mm -hmm. So in phase one, they are looking at 
500 uh, MMT production by 2027. And then that is in terms of just testing out the concept and uh, kind of seeing whether the technologies work or not. In the next phase, which is by 2023, that will be scaled up 10 times, which is 5,000 MMT. So, so going back to your question about renewable, so yes, once the, you know, on the one, one side, uh, EVs will be mainstreamed, on the back of it, the power generation that will feed into the EVs will go into, will come from renewable sources, and solar and hydrogen are going to be major ones in that. Then uh, another aspect that uh, you know I would like to touch upon in terms of direct solar, uh, so the charging infrastructure we are looking at, the first set of you know 380 plus chargers we mentioned that they've already been installed, but we are wor also working on installing solar integrated chargers directly. Mm -hmm. So rather than you know uh, just relying on grid being fed by solar energy, we are also looking at decentralized models of solar. Uh, so you know. This is how the uh, you know renewable energy uh, transition is happening. Going back to the earlier question that was raised on you know whether there's too much competition. So one uh, kind of a very unique aspect of research is that okay, so lab level research can happen, but when it comes to deployment, there has to be a lot of adjustment to local conditions, right? So one is at the pilot stage, and then when you move from pilot to actual uh, light situation deployment. A lot of local, you know, temperature, pressure, usage, behavior, etc., needs to be taken into account, and that is where uh, you know people have to work together and take that research forward. So there's a lot of scope for collaboration, and that is the only way we can move forward because there's no point reinventing the wheel. Thank you. I think uh, fascinating listening to both of you, and I, you know look at the opportunities to rather collaborate, right? And it's good to have a healthy competition also because I think that will then also bring out probably the best on what's working and what's really not working. I go back to this question that, um, are we actually questioning the assumptions of the system itself? Because I'm also looking at this change from a system dynamics. For example, let me just draw attention to the whole electric bus conversation, right? We all are aware that um, India kind of is in the middle of this whole 17,000 electric buses procurement. There have been three tenders that have been underway. Uh, one of them has been financially closed. The others are uh, price points have been discovered. And for me, it's like literally changing the way we were doing the business as usual. Because there was this, if most of you are aware or not, in India, different states, the transport is a state subject, and different states do their own procurement. And for the very first time, we saw five states or five cities from five different states come together and say that we will aggregate our demand. This was unimaginable. And this is something now we are seeing happen, and you see, almost 5,500 electric buses, five cities coming together procuring. With subsidy, we see a price point drop of electric buses becoming 29% prices is cheaper than the diesel counterpart. And then the government, Niti Aayog announces, let's do the national electric bus program of 50,000 electric buses to be procured. Completely agree it's not enough to the scale and the population we have, but yes, the ambition and the targets we are setting high, which is good. And then you have this 6,400, again five, six, seven cities come together and we now have price discovery of 24% less than the diesel buses without subsidy. And then of course the story continues, there's all this another 4,500 bus procurement happening. So what I'm trying to also say is, what are those system level changes that we really need to start thinking? Because, Miranda, you touched upon it, that there is this opportunity. You were also talking about innovation. How do we use technology as a driver to really do things differently and question the assumptions? Because we would have said, in a business as usual scenario, Every city procures its own buses, tries to get its own financing, and is trying to avail its own subsidy, and then, okay, we have bank, 
working after three years, thousand buses. That's what happened in the first three years. Are there any of those kind of models or innovations that's happening, both at system level, that we should be really thinking to really accelerate? Because I also was going through the IPCC highlights, the sixth edition, and it says that we are not doing enough, and we need to accelerate it. And I see the, of course, there's huge financing gap and investments that really needed to make this happen. But can innovation play a role? Would you have any examples? Or can we even explore in this next couple of minutes certain thinking around it? Miranda, you want to go? Thank you. Yeah, that's um, a really exciting set of um, examples that you just brought up. Um, and we see similar trends starting to happen in Europe as well, where um, national states are recognizing that to be competitive internationally, um, a joint procurement uh, can be very important because it creates a demand of such a scale that you really can bargain on the price. Um, so, so that's an interesting model that pushes us in the direction of thinking uh, how can we make um, cleaner technologies more affordable um, and I think that's, that's one thing that's very important. Um, yesterday I learned something that I found also very interesting and that is here in the push to work with the two-wheelers and the three-wheelers as a starting point on the electric transition. Because it also suggests we need to be thinking about the social justice dimension of the transition. Um, and that raises also a lot of um, interesting points in relationship to technology transitions because in the past, it was always assumed that renewables were too expensive and that alternative technologies were only for the rich people or the rich countries. And I think here too we're now starting to see that one, things can be made cheaper with new models, and two, that we can also start to think about how to make transitions not only more inclusive but even more beneficial for those who have in the past been left out of the system or at the bottom end of the system. So um, uh, I think here we also see um, some real possibilities. I think the digital technology and, and artificial intelligence area is also going to completely um, uh, change how we think about a lot of areas of transport. We haven't yet talked about goods transport, um, but logistics is a very, very important um, dimension of transport. and. Um, we know that there's a lot of inefficiency in the existing systems. They've gotten better, um, and there are far fewer empty trucks running around. But um, there's a lot of potential here also for using digital technologies to um, uh, make our logistics more efficient, uh, to better understand um, the distances that actually need to be traveled by, um, by companies who are trying to move goods. Um, but also for consumers, um, the digital uh, revolution can play a big role in helping us to better understand how we eff can efficiently get around. Um, but I also wanted to take the opportunity to go back to where we started, and, and that's thinking about how we design our cities. Because all of what we're talking about now is still kind of defined by the old system. And it's defined by the old system because of the way we've built our cities and because of the way we've um, uh, constructed highways. If we can, especially in a place like India, where you still are going to have to find housing for so many more people who are still yet to come, if we can think of how to design smart mobility um, uh, urban designs so that um, those urban designs are from the start, um, more efficient in terms of time, safety, um, uh, quality, uh, then I think we can do an awful lot. And, and there are examples of that going on. Um, we do see entire new cities that are being designed as sustainable cities, um, where uh, you have entire communities without automobiles. The automobiles are on the outskirts, but inside, um, you are walking, you're in bicycle lanes, you're in um, uh, autonomous driving vehicles. And maybe this is what we need to be thinking about. How do we um, build new and 
let's take some communities within Delhi or within Mumbai and start making those transitions within the existing infrastructure. And here too, I think we're just starting to see this potential. We talked a little bit about it this morning. Um, think about road space. About 5% of German land is nothing other than roads and parking spaces. That's an awful lot of land that could be used for parks, for children, for, um, for other kinds of activities. And we also know that, at least in Germany, 95% of the time automobiles are parked. They're not moving. Um, and that's an awful lot of space that's being used for things that aren't being used. So could we rethink how we go about mobility? Let's have fewer cars, let's use those cars more effectively, shared riding or um, a, a new form of, of, of taxi, for example, so that we don't have as many parked cars sitting around and that we use that space of roads differently. Um, we saw that in Corona, where in many different countries around the world, parking spaces were taken away so that restaurants could put tables outside and people could enjoy the outdoors. So. We need to, to be more creative. And with being more creative, maybe we can come up with more interesting um, solutions. Last comment. Maybe we shouldn't let the technology drive what we're trying to do. We should let our goals and visions drive what kind of technological development we want. Uh, thank you so much, Miranda. And this resonates so well with my heart. I lived in Germany, and uh, you know I've seen the Netherlands system. I love the bicycle tracks they have. And here I live in Gurgaon, and I see they don't even have you know sidewalks, uh, you know, to help people walk safely. So we desperately need a rethink in terms of urban planning, and we need to get serious about it. Uh, coming back to the innovations you mentioned, right? So procurement is one big pain point that needed to be addressed, and thankfully, in this case, you know, the government has taken a very different, uh, you know, uh, uh, approach to procurement. Another area which I think, in the case of EVs, uh, that has been touched is financing, right? So we have seen a number of, I mean, there have been PLIs, uh, you know, way before as well, and in this EV space, we have seen recently. Uh, you know, advanced chemistry cell, uh, you know, uh, coming up as a production uh, linked incentive. Now, there also complete freedom has been given to the industry in the way they come up with battery technology that works. So the market has been given the freedom to drive that instead of dictating what you need to do to avail of this PLI, right? Another thing that has happened, uh, which is not usual, is the first loss cover. So in terms of, okay, so one is the manufacturing side. The other is the banking side, which dictates the demand, right? So banks are very wary of uh, lending, particularly in new uh, lines of lending. So firstly, EV has been prioritized. It's a priority sector lending, uh, which forces the banks to lend. Second is a first loss risk cover in collaboration with the World Bank has been provided uh, to encourage banks to lend in this area. Then there, there are things like interest rate subvention as well, and states are also coming up with these kind of uh, incentives on their own. GST has been reduced on EVs. So a lot of financial impetus has also been given. Third area of focus is uh, you know buyback as well. So how do you develop a secondary market? Unless there is a secondary market, people will not have the confidence to lend or sell. So again, a lot of focus is give, being given on the uh, secondary market. Uh, related to that and related to uh, sustainability in general is uh, battery recycling. And I'm combining both batteries as well as solar panels because huge impetus is on solar panels as well. We do have technologies uh, to process these, uh, you know, solar waste and battery waste, and convert them into valuable products. Uh, you know, you would remember Japanese, uh, you know, Olympics that were there in Japan, right? And all of their metals came from recycled. You know, that was a, you know, nice story to tell. So we have all these technologies that can be planned at scale, where 90% precious metal can be recovered from this. What we need now is, and there is thinking behind it. 
uh, kind of eco parks that kind of recycle and formalize uh, these structures where waste management is also planned. So, yes. So Thank you, um, Shipra, for touching upon uh, financing. I think that's a big bottleneck we always see in the transition and also talking about circularity. I think that emerged as a big theme of uh, this transition when we're talking about how do we ensure that we circularity is in place um, while we're talking about this whole energy and technology adoption. And I really like, Miranda, what you were saying, right? Like our goals and visions should be kind of directing us and not, and then the technology can follow. But a lot of times it's the other way around, right? The technology starts <laughs> dictating. Um, I will go back to our audience who have been patiently listening to us for the last 30-40 uh, minutes. So maybe we can start with the next uh, round of questions. Yeah. Can we get some mics here? Yeah. Thank you. If you can introduce yourself and then uh, ask your specific question, th that would be great. Thank you. I am R. Mehrotra from uh, Delhi Technological University. Uh, I was just uh, trying to think that everything, including the uh, energy transition for other purposes, and even for urban mobility is coming to the renewable energy. So since finance talk was also there, are we in India, for example, we are promoting, we want 500 gigawatt and all that stuff. What is the health of the uh, industry which is implementing the solar plants and all this? Many times we just want something and in the short term, we do not bother, even the entrepreneur does not uh, bother. Afterwards, it becomes sick if the financial viability is not good, everybody thinks that solar power should be two rupees. How it will be two rupees, nobody is knowing. How it will become two rupees, I do not know. Or those people who have to supply, they do not know how it is going to be two rupees. Everybody wants it to be cheap without realizing what is going to be the health of the uh, solar uh, industry. So I am just uh, thinking that the kind of knowledge we have in this thing, we should not lose sight of these aspects. Because in short term, you may get good results, but people start realizing that it is a losing proposition, then they hold back. So I, I think uh, everybody should be concerned about this matter. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for raising that. We'll take two more questions. I think I saw some hands go up. Yeah. So good afternoon. I'll introduce myself. I'm Dr. Amit Sajela from MIT University, uh, head of School of Architecture and Planning. I'm glad that you talked very comprehensively on the issues of urban planning, urban design and things where things have fundamentally gone wrong. I think for a country like India, uh, the paradox is that 75 years ago, we were a cycling nation, and today we are doing advocacy on cycling. So this is fundamentally that we've gone wrong. And probably this is, these are the kind of issues that we need to highlight. And if you look at this transition, to me this transition needs to be looked at from the core of the city which has to be dealt with a different level of complexity to the peri-urban areas where this transition can be made more viable. And it is this reversal that the very peri peri-urban areas get augmented as part of the transition now, and we deal with the internal complexity later on. My critical issue on, on this transition, on the timelines of transition, is not that we are looking at a policy which says, for example, scrap vehicles after 15 years. So you see the amount of carbon that has gone into this, and you say we scrap it after because we want to push a technology. It's being pushed by a, a industry to drive. And then we also try to take leverage the costing of those EV vehicles. 
by virtue of promoting a certain kind of economy. Can we not look at alternatives in terms of retrofit of the existing technology? In case we can retrofit, we would save a lot of carbon credits. We would also be able to create these smart hybrids. And probably we'll be able to save the kind of uh, money that is going into this kind of economy. So uh, countries like India and developing countries do not, cannot afford this kind of luxury. So if the, it, the, the real innovation has to happen, we also need to look at this timeline, the, the transitioning time between which these technologies can be brought in. And then probably it was very well pointed out that uh, the urban sector in terms of mobility is an added layer uh, onto the existing structure. So how this structure helps us, and particularly the issues that we confront with urban mobility is the last mile connectivity. So how do we deal with last mile connectivity is the core issue for us. And while we are working towards all this uh, in longer run, uh, it needs a lot of uh, comprehensive working. And I'm glad you brought out issues of inclusion. I think what we need and what India needs is more of an inclusive city. And if we could work towards that through our planning paradigms and policy initiatives, I think there's a lot more to offer as part of a paradigm which I probably usually call it as uh, alternative urbanism. So I think we need to invest in alternative in urbanism uh, in long run because India is going to urbanize. Of course, we are a very reluctant urbanizer so far. About 32% is what we are urbanizing at. But the way we urbanize in the years to come, I think we need to look for the future ahead. So let's look at those technologies and those areas where alternative systems can be brought in uh, and just not push uh, 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 the technology so that it just meets an end. Yes, we, we all uh, accept energy crisis, energy demands, but let's not do a push in that direction. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Rajesh P. Barnwal from CSIR CMARI. And basically, uh, what we heard or what we're reading, that connected vehicle and connected infrastructure may help a lot. Because the main problem in India, what we are facing is mostly kind of congestion or pollution, right? These are two burning issues in kind of mobility. And mostly these congestions are happening because we are not informed or we are not moving with the informed uh, or we are not taking any informed decision over the road, right? So if we are informed enough that, okay, this area is kind of getting congested more or we are getting diversion or the traffic authority itself will create a diversion or some other way around, I think congestion as well as actually uh, staying for more time on the road, both can be solved easily, right? So connected infrastructure, connecting authorities and connected vehicles may create a kind of solution. I think uh, we can deliberate on this also. Thank you so much. One last question. Or we can ask. I am from Bangalore. So when you talk about congestion, <laughs> so for me, I am like, we move at close to 7 kilometers per hour. Uh, and probably we are better off jogging. <laughs> right? Unfortunately, we don't have footpaths. Otherwise, a lot of people will start walking in Bangalore for the kind of pleasant weather we have uh, throughout the year. So I think those challenges are there. I like what you said. Uh, connected um, infrastructure, you also talked about connected, I think, authorities, right? Bringing all folks working together, I think that's one of the biggest barriers. Uh, it's the whole institutional and governance structure on how do you actually ensure that we're able to do. And see, I think we're also in a paradigm, and I, was, I think Miranda touched briefly about it, and it's also part of India's G20s presidency focus on green development paradigm. I think we are in a phase where we are talking about addressing climate goals and also at the same time ensure that the development is not compromised. Because we have every year the number of jobs that we need to create in India is huge. I mean, we're talking about population growth. We need millions of jobs. I think. Uh, every year to be created. So we have those challenges. While we are addressing climate conditions, let's not forget about livelihoods. Let's not forget about jobs. I think we are all probably one of the most privileged categories sitting here and are able to talk 
but there are people who are actually going to be impacted and uh, it's not so black and white to me any tr of this transition it's not easy to s we don't have to have the choices to say we will do this or that i think if it was such an easy de choices we wouldn't be even deliberating it. it because it's a shade it's a spectrum of solutions and that's the challenge we really face because it is always one versus other and how are you prioritizing is what really makes sense and you need to create then a political will and then you need a financing we need to ensure that our leaders are able to see simple thing why walking doesn't become a political agenda in india why is it that on that agenda people are not able to win elections right it doesn't matter because it's even a common we are used to walking without footpaths we are trained in a way right it's a behavioral issue also and then we also have the other hand of the consumption based issue where we are also the and dominantly the us markets where it's very consumption oriented market so i am glad that we are talking about even life a mission program by the government of india which says that how do you even bring that behavioral nudge to reduce our demand it's not even only the way we change our supply it's also about how we actually kind of judiciously use in a responsive way the demand of what is the scarcely available resource but i'll come back to the panelists we have last 5 minutes and a lot more to really i think excellent questions if you would like to comment no specific order miranda first with you and then shipra thank you yeah thanks so much um i i really like your interventions as well um, I'm going to see if I can race through a few ideas here. Um, retrofitting existing technologies also makes an awful lot of sense. Um, so, so we can't imagine that everything we've been talking about here is going to happen overnight. Um, we also need some transition paths to getting there. Um, but we can also maybe think in somewhat new ways. Um, BMW, which is perhaps not the first company to move into the electric mobility area, is now moving into electric mobility. But they also did something recently in their, their auto show, and I think this is what we actually need. We need those trendsetters to say, this is the cool car. And the cool car that BMW made was a 100% renewable materials car. They made the car from recycled everything. And when you start getting your superstars driving around and saying, hey, I'm in the cool recycled car, um, that starts to make everybody else want to drive in that cool recycled car. Um, and I think we need more of that. Um, and as I was listening to the ambassador talk about the fact that he used to bicycle in Berlin, it made me think at the next G20, we, ha we should get the political leaders of the top 20 countries to go on a bicycle trip. Um, and I actually think if they were to do that, um, it would set a message for the rest of the world about alternative transitions and mobility possibilities. Um, we could also have them go for a walk together. That would also work. Um, uh, information, yeah, and that's where the digital technology and the next generation, the young generation, can really help us. They are so much better at digital than, than my generation I is. We were young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we still are. We still are, of course. Um, but uh, we can do so much with digital technologies. And the, the young kids, they know how to make it fun, too, right? Make games out of, out of technology. So I think we can do there quite a bit. And I loved the comment about connected governance. Because um, although I said, a lot of this is going to be the governments catching up to what the industries are doing. The reality is we also need governments to establish frameworks that will support these kinds of transitions. And we also know that governments tend to be organized just like universities <laughs> in pillars. And they're not very good at thinking across those pillars. And we need to rethink our structures that we have people who are in the Ministry of Transportation talking to the people who are in the Ministry of Energy, who are talking to the people who are in the Ministry of Environment, and maybe we need to get a few more women. And that's the last comment I want to make. I want to thank the organizers, because it's really unusual to have two women 
being the experts talking about mobility in a field that is 95% dominated by men, right? Um, and, <laughs> yeah, and I heard a really wonderful comment the other day. We were driving, yes, driving in a car and looking at cities, and the, the comment was from a German neighbor of mine. She said, look at these cities. You can tell they've been designed by men. And, and, and I asked her to expand on her comment, and she said, well, look, there's no place for the children to play. There are no parks. There's no um, aesthetic beauty here to these buildings. Um, we need to get more women in this field so that we can have new um, uh, viewpoints brought into thinking about mobility and thinking about urban architecture. And if we were more inclusive in this sense, maybe we would also have more livable cities. I mean, taking forward the, you know, the lovely uh, tones you've set up. Uh, firstly, coming to the infrastructure, I think, Pavan, if we build it, people, it's not about the resistance of people to adopting new lifestyles. I remember, you know, 20 years back when I was doing my IIT, right? IIT Kanpur, we used only bicycles. Automobiles, vehicles were not allowed to be kept by students there, and we loved it, right? It was safe inside, and we loved it. Here also, if you look at our generation, I don't know whether young or old, <laughs> right? But so many of us are into marathons and you know stuff like that. So if we create safe pavements, if we have kind of shaded pavements, keeping in mind the weather conditions of India, if we beautify them, why would people not use them, right? Simple things like making overbridges connecting two roads, right? So right now, if I take the example of Golf Course Road in Gurgaon, right? So on one side, you have, you know, apartments like Camellias, et cetera. On the other side, you have, you know, One Horizon Center and uh, your local shops. It's just across the road, but people have to take out their car and move there simply because there's traffic, you know, highway traffic uh, in between. So simple things like connecting two sides of the road with beautiful overbridges will work wonders for uh, town planning, having, you know, place where people can walk. Coming back to your point, sir, about uh, retrofitting of cars. So we do have a few, you know, startups, uh, you know, working on this business model. Uh, but because it's a little bit expensive, so they have focused on retrofitting, you know, expensive cars, like, you know, old Mercedes, old, you know, those kind of things. It will take time as the technology scales up. So, you know, you'll have economics of scale coming in, and probably that technology will become viable for startups to take it up and retrofit existing cars. Also, I think what is missing entirely is technology for tailpipe emissions. So I have been, and it's very, very simple. I remember when I was doing my BTEC, right? One of my um, colleagues, fellow students, he had developed this, as part of his BTEC project, this uh, filter for ta tailpipe emission. And now when I head the cluster and look for these technologies, technologies which we can, you know, propagate, I don't find <laughs> any, right? So these simple things are missing from our uh, ecosystem. Third point, you know, you mentioned about uh, connected, uh, connecting local government bodies. Now, when we think of the government, there's no one single entity. So there are multiple public bodies also that are responsible for execution. I, it's not just in terms of, you know, the ministries talking to each other. It's uh, in terms of the local public bodies also working in tandem. I'll give you an example. We are running, uh, you know, an air pollution mitigation pilot called Project Sameer. Uh, where, uh, amongst other things, we're also looking at science and technology interventions. So we have solutions for both monitoring as well as mitigating PM levels. And there we are executing this project in Delhi with DPCC and in Gurgaon with GMBO. It's becoming a nightmare <laughs> just to seek permissions and get work orders for installation. Even though we are not asking for any public money, it's all CSR funded and startups are absorbing part of the cost. Still getting work orders is a complete nightmare. So that's a broken system that needs to be fixed. How it will be fixed, I do not know. Finally, sir, you raised the point of solar companies, the financial health of solar companies. I think solar model has been fairly successful. Yes, some companies have struggled, but now it's a very, very profitable model, particularly where companies have come up with just an OPEX model. So use pay-per-use basis where the CAPEX uh, you know, is kind of 
taken care of and there are government uh, subsidies and government mechanism, funding mechanism, which you can avail of. Likewise, for other renewable sources also, such models can be explored where financial health of the companies will not be put at risk. That is one. But a bigger issue in terms of wider proliferation of solar, so why do, do we not have more of solar, is the hesitation from DISCOMs. So currently, the DISCOMs that are uh, you know, relying on coal-powered plant, etc., they are resistant that if you know, solar comes into existence, maybe the pricing will not work in their favor. So that hesitation, that structure, incentive structures there need to be worked out at policy level so that uh, they don't uh, you know, become resistant to more uh, wider proliferation of solar. Thank you so much. We are at the end of the session. While I was starting, I was like, "How? Do, what will we do with 60 minutes? And now it seems that it's not enough. <laughs> um, but um, in fact, uh, WRI is also supported by ICI. And under the NDCTI initiative led by NITI, we actually have a parallel event going on on gender and mobility. You know, And it's like a whole day event. I <laughs> just left that and came here. It's amazing that, you know, how we are mainstreaming these conversations and move from ideas to action. And we also ensure that every session is moderated by women. And we have more women panelists in the session. And also to ensure that men actually listen for a change. <laughs> so I think on that note, uh, thank you um, for the forum, the Indo-German Partnership and the forum for really inviting um, us and you know for having this conversation. I hope. Uh, the audience had a good time understanding and listening. So, and also thank you so much, Miranda, uh, to both you, Miranda, you and uh, Shipra for, I think it was a gamut of conversations we really had. And, and I thoroughly enjoyed this. And I also learned a lot from both of you. So thank you, one. Let's give a big round of applause to our speakers and to audience for patiently listening us. Thank you. Thank you, Pawan. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Shipra. Thanks a lot. This was a very interesting conversation, and you've set the stage for so many ideas the next two days. So once again, thank you so much. Um, we have a short break planned now so that you can interact also with the speakers and take the conversations over coffee or tea. We will come back for the next session on integrated uh, engineering for sustainable mobility with some of our workshop participants who've been here for the last two days. Um, and I would like to then ask the audience here and the live stream audience to take a short 30 minutes break. Uh, tea coffee is served outside. You can take your conversations also outside and be back in 30 minutes. Thank you so much.
Liverpool conference room. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the participants. And there's a live stream, and they, I, mean, I don't know how many, but they invited keynote speakers, and like one of one had an um, inspirational keynote, and he said, okay, he just came by plane, and it's just a nice journey, just for two people to the audience. sitting in front of a, of a big screen, <laughs> but decided to leave after a while anyway. All right, I think we can start with the next session. Thanks for coming back from the coffee break. I request everyone to take their seats. So um, 
The next session is a panel discussion on integrated engineering for future urban mobility. In this panel, we have researchers who have been part of uh, a week-long workshop uh, together which we organized with IIT Delhi, CSIR, and the DU9 group of universities on, um, on integrated engineering for future mobility, exactly the topic that you see here. And uh, they will discuss here mobility from interdisciplinary perspectives, and they will also share their insights onto their own research that they have done, and also the discussions that they've had in the last two days. And for this, I would now um, introduce shortly the moderator that we have here, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Regina Gerica. Dr. Gerica is the head of the chair of Integrated uh, Transport Planning and Traffic Engineering at the Technical University of Dresden. And before that, she chaired the Institute for Transport Studies at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, Austria. Before that, she was an assistant professor at the Technical University of Munich and um, uh, assistant professor and head of the Research Center Mobility and Transport, so from the field. And her research, research interests include travel behavior, transport, planning, and traffic safety with a focus on vulnerability of road users. Professor Gerke, hand it over to you to introduce the panel here and uh, steer the discussions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Adi Schrief, um, and welcome to everybody here in the room. So we see we are more people now than we have been before, and we are a young group. So in this workshop, uh, these were PhD students. Um, so we are a young group, except myself, of course. Um, uh, so we have worked uh, un up uh, in the last uh, two days uh, on engineering future mobility. So I think it's perfect uh, to link up uh, where the former panel ended and to ask now what are the research questions um, that we need to solve yeah, for um, moving forward with uh, engineering future mobility and um, to look at this from the different perspectives. So who are we here on the panel? So let me start with um, Jose Davis. Uh, so he comes uh, to us from uh, Aachen University, so RWTH Aachen University. Um, actually, he did his uh, bachelor here in India. And then he moved uh, uh, to Germany for the um, master studies in uh, transportation planning and engineering. And then the, he stayed there for uh, his PhD, or currently you are doing uh, your PhD in life cycle analysis. Yeah, so really uh, engineering. And then we have Zayan um, here from IIT Delhi, and he comes from computer science. So he uh, did his uh, education and even the PhD in the United States, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. And he works on optimizing transportation systems, but from computer science perspective, so really data driven. Yeah, so this is our expertise in computer science here. Then we have Hannes Hobby from Theo Dresden Research uh, Associate in Energy Economics. Um, so uh, sector integration yeah, between uh, mobility and energy. This is the expertise that you bring in uh, here. Also a PhD student, but almost finished, uh, I have learned. And then we have Jonas Lamberg from University in Hannover, and he comes from planning. So we have touched on this, yeah, urban and transport planning. Uh, you cannot separate the two things. So this is the background uh, that we have here. And then we have engineering, vehicle engineering, so optimizing the uh, EV powertrain. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Rubinro coming um, here from the Institute, Indian Institute of uh, Petroleum. So this is the group we have here. And we have worked in the last two days in this workshop uh, with an innovative method that is called design thinking. So this is about um, defining the problem first. So this is normally used in product development. So what are our products in research? Uh, our products are research ideas and research proposals. Yeah. So we started in defining the problems, then generating ideas, um, having some testing um, some first presentations and um, then refining them and, and presenting them. Um, of course, there's no implementation um, so far. So my first question to the panel would be, um, what ideas uh, did you generate? Uh, we had um, four groups in the end who worked on these ideas and I think we have three groups represented here. Uh, on the um, uh, panel. So who wants to start just telling a bit about 
how was it for you to work uh, with these design thinking formats and uh, what did you find? Jonas, you want to start? Yeah, thank you very much for this great introduction. Um, my group was basically focusing on urban as well as transportation planning and that was also mainly the background of the participants we had. And we finally came up with two different research projects. So one is time framing of large scale projects. So think of metro lines, for example, or high speed rail lines. No matter if we are looking at Germany or India, we face similar um, challenges in the end. So we have a higher budget than planned or an extension of uh, time. And this is really something we would like to investigate if there are common things in both countries or differences and how we possibly could learn from each other to um, have better implementation processes in the, in the future. Second project we came up is um, the redesign or future design of urban street layouts. We've been talking about urban streets um, in the uh, panel before already and as you may know there are many differences in uh, comparison between India and Germany and the main question is what should be the future goal how would we like to create new and livable urban spaces and this is definitely something we would like to discuss in an international perspective and um, yeah we are looking forward for future collaboration in these two fields uh, yeah, my, uh, uh, good evening, everyone. And the, my group uh, belongs to the uh, battery, uh, battery, EV battery system. And the, as you know that uh, in an electric vehicle, the 50% of the cost uh, is of the battery. So right now, India uh, doesn't have the, uh, the factory and the industry to develop indigenous uh, the EV batteries. So uh, our group was discussing, uh, starting from the material availability, and then manufacturing, then circularity, then prototyping. Then <coughs> apart from that, the uh, manpower requirement at each and every stage is, that's called the uh, skill development. So this, everything is uh, uh, connected to the, our uh, government's admission, Atma neighbor that's uh, uh, import substitution. And then unless we have a, uh, uh, import substitution that uh, one uh, product so our EV industry is not uh, going to have uh, this that sustainable type of uh, that industry so that is where we are focusing on the main theme that resilient indigenous and uh, uh, sustainable that was the our theme and then uh, we are trying to develop a joint uh, proposal working together and complementing each other's research and uh, something like uh, uh, towards sustainable end-to-end -end, uh, EV battery uh, for uh, better technology for India as well as for Germany. Something like that. Uh, it is just uh, uh, in the stage of formulating and uh, we have a lot of work to be done and uh, to cover and uh, to do a lot of uh, next stage brainstorming. Yeah, this first, first round I would like to pull like that. Thank you. Thank you. So Zayen and uh, Davis, you have been in the same group, so maybe you want to complement uh, some ideas from your side. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So I was in part of the same group. Um, so one observation that we have to be aware of is that um, EV adoption in India is right now at a very, very nascent stage. There are hardly any EVs. I mean, it's just starting to pick up. Um, but it will not pick up gradually. There will be, certain, there will be a transition at some point in the future where more people will want to go for EVs than the regular fuel-powered cars. And we have to be ready for that, uh, with ready with the infrastructure when that transition takes place. And that also means that although we are slightly behind in terms of adoption compared to, let's say, Europe or US, we have a lot to learn from them. We can learn from what they did, what they did correctly and what they did not do correctly. And therefore, we need this collaboration between uh, one part of the team who are familiar with some part of this development of EV ecosystem and particularly the battery which we are looking at as well as bring in the Indian needs. For example, um, in Europe or in Germany, as I learned from my colleagues, is that most of the EVs are targeted 
or the battery for the EVs are targeted for the expensive and the premium cars like the BMWs, Mercedes, Teslas, and so on. Now, if you think about the EV adoption in India, it is about it is what are the vehicles that are mostly used adopting EVs? It's the scooters, followed by maybe the three wheelers, and then the we see smart blues and some of the smaller cars. EVs in SUVs are slowly kind of coming, right? So there's a need for in India for the batteries that we'll need for EVs is different, right? So we need to adopt the some of the technologies that has already been developed, but also customize it for Indian needs. And I think that is what is a value of this particular workshop. It brings multiple people from multiple expertise and experiences and allows us to come up with complementary skill sets um, that can really do something um, you know, which has not been done yet, right? And that's why we're excited about research. It's about doing something that has not been done yet. Yeah. Uh, adding to that, uh, first of all, thank you DWEH organizers and RWTH Aachen for the opportunity to be here. As a young researcher, I'm so happy to be engaged with a senior scientist uh, to talk about the sustainable future mobility. And I also belong to the battery group. And we here try to build up a sustainable future mobility for India. When we talk about sustainability, and we are nowadays trying to adopt electric vehicles with the battery. And if we look into the life cycle perspective from the raw material extraction, considering raw material extraction, uh, manufacturing usage, and recycling stage, the electric vehicles nowadays only solves a problem from the use phase. And it is really important to consider the problems of other stages, which is only possible with the life cycle assessment. And if we look into the EV, which really solves a problem of environmental problems, but we have to look that when we try to solve the problem of the climate change, there is another problem that is rising up, which are the social impacts. When we look into the raw material extraction, which is most of it coming from uh, uh, cobalt, which comes from co co Congo, manganese, 80% come from China. If you look into the child labor, forced labor, and other social impacts to these countries, it's really, really, really high. So India, how to come up with a solution? Yeah, India recently found out a lithium mine. So when we mine this uh, lithium, we have to take into consideration the social impacts that is already happening. And we try, we should try to make the supply chain sustainable as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hannes, you have worked about travel behavior or in the wider sense, yeah? Yes, um, thank you. First of all, I also wanted to say that it was very overwhelming to, uh, to me to see so many young researchers uh, from Germany and also from India working together and, and problems to find solutions that are very keen to what they do very highly motivate, motivated, making me confident that we find solutions to the seven challenges that you brought up to you just and um, like we discussed in the panel before. I was uh, working on, uh, with together with the group, uh, on a uh, proposal that we framed uh, sector integrated concepts for future mobility in urban areas. So like, what does it mean? It's more a systemic view on transport rather than looking on a specific technology like a battery for instance. So when it comes to transport concepts, we think about like mode choice. So what is impacting the individual's um, selections for either one mode of a transport or the other mode of transport? So people do have preferences obviously one is taking a cab because it's like very convenient for him one is taking a private car because it's very secure for him one uh, likes to walk because it's good for the health depending of course on, on the environment but at the end it may yield in a solution that is inefficient that creates pollutions right that creates um, a traffic jam on the streets so like this is not an optimization, which is looking on the system at the whole what individuals are optimizing themselves. And we try to find solutions um, that is looking onto the system as a whole, uh, try to propose services that will guide people's decisions in choosing uh, different transport modes that will in the end, um, let's say, increase the value for the system as a whole, and we frame it also sector integrating concepts since we believe transportation is not only related to streets or to metro, but 
let's think about electric vehicles. We've heard about electric vehicles, for instance, exert a strong impact also on the electricity system. So other infrastructures beyond just like streets and um, like other infrastructures also need to be taken into account. Thank you so much. So these were the topics that we worked on and uh, discussed in the last day. So now we can widen a bit the perspective and link up, follow up where you have ended in the previous uh, forum. And one thing that you have discussed and that you have also touched on, uh, uh, Hannes, right now is uh, the difference um, between the individual optimum and the system optimum. And I'd like to ask you this, uh, Sayan, because you work on goods delivery yeah, from your computer science uh, perspective. And my impression is that you have touched on this. Yeah, goods delivery is a problem, so we have inefficiencies there. And one reason for this is that all the suppliers, the logistics providers, providers, they optimize their services, but from their individual point of view, not from the system point of view. So what is your view on this? Um, how can this be solved and what research uh, can contribute uh, to these to solve these problems? Right, so let me give a little bit of background, right? So in India, we are all sort of familiar with Swiggy, Zomato, and Big Basket, and all the f delivery apps. And even, you know, from, um, those outside India, right? Uh, food delivery is like, a, it's there in every part of the globe probably today. Um, so in India it is even more popular because human labor is comparatively much cheaper. So it is, it is easier to, and easier and business-wise it makes more sense to make them operational. Um, now I have been collaborating with uh, several of these food delivery aggregators and other grocery delivery aggregators and so on um, to try to optimize their their delivery network. So what do I mean by optimize? So suppose you order, right now let's say you order pizza, right? In, mo in many companies what happens is when you order a pizza, you select exactly which restaurant the order goes to. That restaurant has some assigned delivery workers who are going to be allocated and the, and the worker then sends it the, the pizza to you. And same for let's say Big Basket and, and some of the other ones, right? I haven't directly worked with them but this is in general the technology. What, what we need to do to make the system more efficient in a futuristic world is that when you order a food item, it should not automatically assign it to the nearest cloud kitchen, which we call it cloud kitchen, because you don't go to the kitchen, it just prepares a food item for you. So it should, the algorithm should design which is the cloud kitchen that depending on the loads and the availability of other delivery person in the vicinity should prepare it, right? And then, it should allocate which is the delivery person who should get, I mean, who should deliver it to you. And the delivery person should not be tightly coupled with a single restaurant because then you are making the system more inefficient. And finally, there is this other component about which are the food items that are going to be delivered to two different houses perhaps, but can be batched together because they are on the route. These are complex questions and particularly complex when you are getting 500 or thousands of orders per minute. Think about a Swiggy scale or Zomato scale or a Domino scale or, and so on. So how do you solve this complex problem in a scalable manner where you need results in real time, right? So this is one of the problems that we are working on in collaborations. But now when you talk, talk to, let's say, the business entities, the food delivery aggregators or the grocery aggregators, they will think about how do I deliver orders as quickly as possible. That's what they are thinking about because they are thinking only from the customer's perspective. But there are other partners here. And more, the most, well, I should not say most important, but of the important partners are the delivery agents. Um, what we have seen from the data is that if the delivery agent is present in a region that has lots of restaurants or lots of residential zones, they earn a lot more versus those who are on the outskirts of the city, right? And even when they are, they are gig workers, right? They, do not, they are not under any employment contract. So when they're on board, they do not know how much they are going to earn. In, uh, in for working for one hour or two hour. Uh, so how do we make sure that the income, first of all, income distribution among the delivery workers is more evenly distributed so that they are not rushing to serve in the same location, right? Um, how do you ensure that they work with a little bit more certainty? For example, I mean, uh, assume working in a job where you don't know what your salary is going to be, right? I mean, we don't, we won't like that job. So can, they, can we say that, you know, that given the current business um, dynamics, the uh, number of orders or volumes coming up. If you work for the next two hours, we can, min we can guarantee that you will have a minimum income of, of, of a certain amount, 
right? And give a little bit more certainty to these delivery workers so that they have the option to say, okay, do I work for two hours and make enough, you know, enough money to survive? Or do I sort of work somewhere else? Because they are gig workers. They can work on multiple different, um, you know, um, jobs, right? They are not contractually obligated to something, right? So these are important questions because from the delivery aggregator's perspective, they are thinking about revenue, customer satisfaction. From the food delivery agent's perspective, they are thinking about, you know, how do I make the world a little bit more fair and more equitable so that the income is distributed more equitably. And then the restaurants are thinking about how do I ensure that I get exposed to enough number of customers because when we open an app, we, sh we get shown some 10 or 12 or 20 restaurants from which has a much higher chance of getting a food these order. So, these are so many other. questions. So yeah. many questions, right? Yeah. So how do we sort of go and solve this question? So these are some very important questions that we have to solve for a smarter and more equitable and sustainable development of this entire delivery ecosystem. Yeah, and this is multi-criteria optimization. So this is not only about optimizing traffic, but also uh, all these social issues, yeah, jobs and these things are really um, important, yeah. Uh, Dr. Rubindro, um, what about, so this was about operation. Uh, you come from the vehicle technology uh, perspective. So what is your contribution to uh, future mobility, to engineering future mobility for all these different applications? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajna. Um, before coming to that, I just uh, throw a line uh, regarding the uh, energy-oriented objectives from the government side, like uh, India imports around 80% of the uh, total load oil con consumption from other countries. There's a huge amount of money going out of the country, right? That's why we are introducing the E10, E20, B10, B20, and so on and so forth, so that we reduce the uh, import energy bill. That is why all this alternative uh, mobility and then uh, uh, electric mobility uh, comes into uh, this picture and trying to uh, play and uh, reduce the uh, energy import bill. This is all around and the objective. And again, this is aligned with the uh, India's uh, uh, Pans Amrit, uh, the fly, uh, five uh, global objective, like uh, net zero 2070, then reduction of carbon emission less than 40% by 2030, then uh, so on and so forth, right? So everything is uh, revolving around this. Main idea is to reduce the uh, energy uh, import bill. So now coming back to the, your uh, this thing, uh, uh, from the mobility perspective, uh, that what could happen in uh, in future is that uh, in future we are going to have a multiple mobility technology consisting of ice engine technology, e electric vehicle, then uh, uh, hybrid uh, electric vehicle. In the ice engine technology, there will be a flex engine, uh, like with the uh, flex fuel uh, vehicles. Flex engine uh, is something like the uh, the ice engine, uh, which will be operated from uh, E20, that means 20% of ethanol or uh, more than 20%. So it becomes the, like a uh, uh, flexi fuel vehicle. So these are all already in talk, like we have uh, uh, biofuel policies in India. Why we are doing this? As I said, uh, to reduce the import, uh, the uh, energy import. So the, these technologies, the multiple players will be there in future. Then uh, at certain point of time, and the, uh, uh, the sustainable mode of transportation like uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicle, then electric vehicle uh, will be uh, having more percentage than the, this conventional vehicle. So it is a, a, like a journey uh, that we uh, foresee it and uh, from the uh, technology trends going on uh, from the state of art and uh, the, the research going on. That, that is what uh, I would like to put. Uh, so uh, that is how, uh, yeah, the next, I think I will come back to the next question. Thank you so much. So Davis, about life cycle analysis. So we have learned that there will be a mix of technologies and this to totally makes sense in the future. Um, so what is life cycle analysis? What are the similarities and the differences in India and in Germany, seeing all the different uh, types of vehicles that we have yeah, uh, in the two countries and uh, that we have today and that we expect to have in the uh, future? Uh, there is a lot of differences between India and Germany. If you look into the Germany, German people are more likely to have a car with high technical um, capabilities, right? If you look into the Indian Indians, Indians would, would like to have more affordable products, services, or technology. Uh, on the basis of that, there you can also find the difference in the kind of mobility. 
if we look into the german rods you will see most of the rods but if you look into the indian rods you can see a lot of rickshaws and bicycle uh, and these are a kind of uh, sustainable mode of transport in my point of view because this reduces if you look into the rickshaws uh, uh, this reduces traffic congestion parking space climate change uh, and, uh, and if it is automatized uh, it's this is also a large benefit according to the Boston consulting group they had made a uh, life cycle impact assessment and they found that that found out that automated multimodal ride sharing will enable the cities to have 54 percentage less vehicles 87 percentage less accidents and a 50 around 50 percentage less parking and uh, uh, and I forgot the other yeah so the, so so the carpooling uh, has a huge impact on the sustainable urban mobility for tomorrow's future yeah so this is for you, Jonas, or you work on public transportation, <laughs> so how should this look like in the future, <laughs> incorporating all these uh, different services? So we talk about mobility as a service, yeah? So not only public transportation as we uh, often define it in uh, Germany, yeah? Just line-based, uh, with a timetable, fixed routes, fixed stops, and these things, but being um, more flexible. Uh, demand driven uh, in the future. So what can we learn uh, between the countries? How does this look like uh, in the future, the public transportation systems? So I'm really impressed how far India is um, concerning digitalization, for example, having different services like Uber, which was a big problem to implement in Germany. So this is definitely something um, yeah, I definitely take back to Germany that uh, we, can, we can learn from, from India. On the other hand, um, it is really important to understand that we shouldn't think problems from digitalization, but from the problem itself. So we have congested roads, we have high pollution, and digitalization is not a solution, but might be a tool. <coughs> so rather than implementing mobility as a service solutions or Uber, we should think of all the systems we have. And I think traditional modes of transportation like public transport, they need to be the backbone of future systems. And uh, anyhow, of course, they are first and last mile problems, but um, at least a certain distance is totally fine for many people to walk. And um, I think digital services can be an add-on, but they shouldn't be the main solution for future mobility because otherwise we're going to create some more traffic on the roads. And according to, to the group, um, I've been working with my colleagues from Germany and India. This is not um, yeah, the vision that we have for, for future mobility. Thank you. So one more question to Hannes, and I, then I would like to open the question uh, to the audience also. So Hannes, uh, we all want to see more EVs, yeah? um, electric vehicles and transportation. So what is your view as an energy economist uh, on this? So what happens when we have all these EVs in transportation with the energy system? So you come from Germany, but you're more than invited to take the two perspectives again, yeah, as you have learned in these two days, the Indian one uh, also. Yeah, um, let me answer this um, question, well, like approach answering this question with the picture, like the graph. So like if you imagine you have a time scale 24 hours and the electric load on the y-axis and you plot the load for a day at which there's a World Cup final in soccer or football, some say soccer, some say football. And then now imagine how the load evolves exactly in the halftime break. So this is a picture we show quite often in Germany. The load like suddenly pops up a lot and this creates stress to electricity grids. So now imagine we got a lot of electric vehicles in the systems like we want to achieve in Germany as well. All those um, cars owned by private household owners are coming back in the afternoon and want to plug in their cars into the sockets so that they get charged. It's a huge, like spontaneous increase in the load. So um, I think the biggest challenge is like integrating those electric vehicles in the systems. And from my point of view, it needs connected infrastructures as it was brought up 
today, but also I want to emphasize it's not only a technological uh, challenge, I would say it's more about a coordination problem. We need to coordinate like people's charging behaviors or companies who are operating uh, electric vehicle fleets charging behaviors. And when it comes to coordination, we need to think about how could we coordinate the are on coordination is also strongly connected with behaviors and incentives in this sense. And in our research in Germany, we like to try to, to post about more about these coordination uh, coordination problems. Do you want to add on it or no? Okay. Then you want to add? Yeah, yeah, maybe one more thing. It's the same with public transportation. So it's not only about creating infrastructure for certain needs but it's also about um, somehow engineering people's demands and needs. And I think um, no matter in which country, um, mode choice can be shifted if we do the right me measures in society. So um, infrastructure, of course, is al has always a high impact on, on uh, environment, with concrete and steel and so on. And there might be way better changes from the societal perspective. Yeah, I think yes. Uh, I would like to give one uh, one comment on this. Uh, in the previous speaker, they were talking about the solar integrated charging station that could uh, come in handy for the remote areas where you don't have the uh, grid infrastructure. So uh, it's kind of solar integrated, or otherwise we have a, a renewable hybrid energy system where you combine the wind, solar, and the, the biofuel uh, subjected to the availability of that location, then integrate everything. For a en for a hybrid energy supply system, so which could be used for your domestic use as well as for uh, EV charging system. That we have already developed one prototype and uh, which is uh, working fantastic. We are having in uh, one in our campus. It is a, uh, a hybrid system. We are combining the biofuel and the wind and the solar, and uh, we are using it for EV charging. So same energy you can use for domestic purpose, depends on the uh, geographical location. It can be used for agri-purpose, for uh, uh, water pumping, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Questions from the audience to us here at the panel. Uh, there are two, three, uh, four. May I ask? I just start. Thank you for working up. Thank you. Interesting uh, workshop that you all engaged in. And she started off with the first statement. What was the research question? So I'm dropping a research question to you. The problem for Indian traffic and the volume uh, is to be dealt with the number of modes of transport, what we call it as modal mix. Uh, I, just to inform you that we, our research informs us that we have some 35 plus modes of transport on the street at the same time with variable transmissions. Now, how do you manage this? These 35 modes of transport at the same time, and particularly during the peak hour traffic. I think we need solutions in digitally, probably through AI solutions. And a lot of these solutions also lie in management. How do you manage traffic? So if I think we work on these areas, they would be very critical to optimization uh, of the peak hour flow. Uh, and the quantum of volume of traffic that we can handle uh, during peak hours, and that is particularly connected to the timeline management. So if these can be worked upon, I think these are gray areas to look into. But this is the reality that we are going to stay with these variable modes of transport, and modal mix and passenger carrying capacities is going to be the catch. And ultimately, you did refer to something like street design. I think we need to invest heavily into street design uh, particularly from this perspective of modal mix. I think this is definitely something we can learn from you. So we often have four, yeah? So walking, cycling, public transport, car, and that's it, yeah? 35, wow. <laughs> uh, since we are discussing about the developing country, so one issue which is very important for us is what would be, when would it be commercially acceptable? So do you have any idea how, what would be per kilowatt hour expense or cost? I should not say expense, cost. 
what do you think would be when we could think of really implementing it in a big way, your ideas which you are. And the other one crops up from the discussion from the first panel, and that word was on charging. I was listening to this very interesting ways of charging, and then you talked about this electric locomotive. So I was thinking like if the locomotives just go up, they take the electricity and they move. I mean, the locomotive the train moves. Same way, do, can you think of a charging mechanism where you use your battery to move, and if you have a grid which could actually give you an option to charge the next battery? So it's like a dynamic charging where your vehicle keeps on moving, but you're all discussing about static charging. Stop the car, wait, go to sleep, we will charge. How about doing it in real mode? You're talking about real mode, real mode. Let's talk about real mode. Can you think of dynamic charging and bring down the cost so that it's acceptable to a normal person like me? So there's one more there, and then Dr. Lash here. Uh, hello. Uh, when, when we are talking about uh, sustainable urban mobility and the engineering part, one of the important things which has been mentioned is uh, relating to the life cycle now, uh, since uh, mobility is very much associated with the uh, pollution aspects and uh, shift to, um, I mean, electric and all this is due to the, largely due to pollution aspects as well. Uh, what is the, uh, I mean, embedded energy? That is first a starting point we must think about and it has to do later with the circular economy it has also to do with the uh, condemnation of the vehicle after 10 years or 15 years. So all these things need to be worked out, particularly for a country like India. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do not take everything into account, unfortunately. So I, I just wanted to know that what is the embedded energy, one is energy, and embedded pollution if you, we can describe it, mm -hmm. in a standard vehicle of certain horsepower or whatever description you want to give it in terms of size or carrying, uh, load, carrying capacity or load. Thank of you. the current type of uh, fuel-driven vehicles or all this uh, petroleum-driven vehicles and electric. And what is the life time you recommend for example in india now the petrol car is recommended for 15 years diesel car has been recommended for 10 years there is a statutory provision of that particularly with reference to certain type of cities so i i think before we move forward existing things need to be analyzed thank you yeah, I have a more generic question. I'm not from the field of uh, <laughs> of mobility and energy. So, uh, and we discussed this a bit uh, during these days. I would be interested, uh, we sometimes come from Germany with the perspective, we bring our models to the world, no, to the Southern Hemisphere. And this is a question who goes to Jonas and Hannes, what do we can learn from India? Because uh, India is not seeing themselves as a developing country anymore, so, but also for the, for the other participants. So what we can learn from each other and why we should learn from each other? And let me challenge you in the second question. You know, India is very focused on cooperating with UK, US. No, we all know this. Why in this specific field, India and Germany should cooperate together uh, for, for driving it forward? What is the added value for that specific cooperation? I think Davis would be a good, <laughs> very good candidate to answer this, but maybe all the others. Well, what you see in the scope and the benefits of working these two countries, and we just uh, heard it in the previous panel, that uh, there might be benefits, but what is your perspective and why should one not look to the US, what we also Germans tend to do in this field. Thank you. There was one more from, from the back. I think we should take this and then back to the panel. So thank you. I'm Silvan coming from Karlsruhe University from Germany. And I think when we are talking about integrated engineering for future mobility, we have to look um, from a holistic view on our city, New Delhi. So when I came to Delhi, 
last week I was shocked about the electric grid. So the cars perhaps are ready to be operated on the streets, but is the grid of India, so the electric grid, really ready for all the electric cars or replacing all cars or shifting to electric? I think this is also a question we have to discuss and also a little bit a more holistic view to the transformation to electrify all sectors. Okay, so thank you. So various questions from various different uh, perspectives. So one general one, yeah, about um, the benefits of uh, collaborating between the countries. Then the modes uh, and travel behavior, how to how to manage this also, and then some more technical ones that I think ma might be for you, Davis, and, and you. Do you want to start with? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I would like to start with the first question regarding the uh, the life uh, life of electric vehicle and in comparison with the ice engine vehicle. Ice engine vehicle, as per the legislation, we have a uh, ten years or ten years for digital and fifteen years for. Uh, for uh, no 10 years for gasoline and 15 years uh, no uh, yeah other way around so anyway uh, the for right now for uh, uh, for EV there is no such uh, you can say the legislation right now not defined and the we have done a research we have done a case study in our lab that uh, the coming back to your previous question the retrofitting the existing uh, vehicles because we have around 60 million uh, vehicles on road that is operating now. They are adverse. Some millions are adverse of retirement because of the legislation saying that you cannot apply. There will be heavy penalties and so on and so forth. So uh, India, being uh, the developing country and the everybody, the owners, they don't have the financial uh, freedom to buy a vehicle overnight or maybe in month. So uh, the replacement of their uh, in in use vehicle is uh, is going to be challenged. So. To fill that gap, you have the uh, retrofitting kit, the EV kits for different segments for the three-wheeler and a four-wheeler. We have a L1, L2, L3, L5 category, M1 and M2 dot categories. So there will, uh, so that's what we have uh, worked uh, for this developing of indigenous EV kit. So we have done uh, two prototyping. So that is where we want to fit uh, into that. So that is one solution. And uh, for regarding the, uh, uh, I think, uh, I, I, yeah, am I? Did I answer your question or? Yeah, and the, uh, regarding the, uh, I just I have a comment from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Katia, yeah, Katia's comment that actually uh, be, uh, Germany being in the, you can say, uh, one of the leading automotive companies in the world, uh, like followed by Japan and Korea. So Germany has a very century old, uh, you can say, uh, the automotive re uh, experience as well as uh, expertise and, uh, uh, you can see in uh, in India we have a uh, very successful Germany companies, right? But uh, U.S. Uh, I think unfortunately the GM and the uh, the Ford they already left the country, so probably this could be the one the why we are uh, <laughs> the bending towards the Europe uh, mostly on in Germany because German cars very successful here, very safe, and the, we learn from the uh, the European and the, in India uh, from the legislation point of view we also follow the European norms. Like in driving cycle, we have an Indian MIDC cycle, right? It is a copy from the European cycle. So we have a phase one, phase two, everything is copied from the uh, uh, European norms. Only thing is that speed limit, uh, speed limit is reduced as per our Indian uh, road conditions. So, so that's why uh, we, why we are, is by default or by legislative perspective, then we are bending towards uh, the Europe. And then in Europe, Germany is in the front. That's why, it's better to learn from the leader, not from the uh, second leader or something. Uh, that, that's how I'm from my perspective. Who, who wants to follow up? You, Davis, and you can always take the two, yeah? So the more technical question on the EVs and the collaboration question from uh, Dr. Lash, yeah? yeah. Uh, if we can, when we talk about EVs or vehicles, it's not embedded emissions. When we talk about the life cycle perspective, it's absolute emission rather than considering carbon intensity. If we consider only the road transportation, road transportation only contributes about 15 percentage of carbon emission. But why we are so much interested in looking to solve the 
climate problem from road transportation because it increases really faster from than any other sector. So the number of vehicles are increasing, and the, that, that's why that's why we should consider absolute emission rather than embedded emission. And the other point was raised to us: it is lifetime should be considered. When we talk about the lifetime, there was a project from Bosch. They have tried to analyze their uh, air conditioner. And they found that after eight years of time, this should be changed because by that time, an energy efficiency of a product will definitely change. This is the same when we consider the battery electric vehicle or the fuel cell maybe in the future. After some times, the energy density of the battery will definitely increase. Energy efficiency might increase. So we have an optimum lifetime, which is not yet found out uh, as far as I know. So. That, is, that this should be considered. And the other point was how the possibilities for German cooperation. It, Germany has a strong technology push, while the India has a strong market pull. And I must admit that Germany is, as I am from Germany, and I do masters from Germany, and now I am doing PhD in Germany. And I, I can really compare between German education and also Indian education. German technology is really, really good that, that uh, we can adopt, but there is a lack of labor there. This is one point. So a lot of young talents are here in Germany, so which can support Germany in its journey to continue its technology push. And the another point that I have to raise uh, uh, is that amid war and also the COVID, there, there were all, all there were so many market issues, supply chain issues. Germany as the largest, one of the largest OEM of the world, this needs a lot of raw materials. And I think India, India should find a way to support them with the raw materials by uh, make strengthening the market of Germany as well as increasing the economy of India. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the question came up about um, looking on electric uh, mobility more with a holistic perspective, and I just um, want to uh, to address this question. In my eyes, as I just said, uh, electric vehicles will stress grids, but um, electric vehicles also, as we have heard in the panel before, have a battery included, right? And they the cars are standing most of the time, as we have heard, and um, at the same time in Germany, when we are trying to um, electrify the mobility sector, we are also want to electrify the heating sector and decarbonize the industry sector, which is increasing electricity loads, which uh, requires a massive build out of um, renewable energy generation technologies and like EG wind, uh, like for example wind onshore technologies, wind offshore technologies, solar. But integrating those technologies itself uh, constitutes a challenge. Um, so like we re really need to exploit the flexibility potential I would say that comes with all the storages also to integrate the generation technologies into our system in order to successfully uh, decarbonize our um, energy system as a whole. Yeah, and moreover, this again in my eyes is not only a technological uh, question, because like those technologies and cars, for instance, like are mostly owned by private households, yeah, private uh, persons, but typically those persons don't have access to a market, but if we want to uh, exploit the flexibility, those people need to be able to offer their flexibility to some markets. So we also need to find new market, market solutions that enable access of owners to, yeah, like sell the services they might could sell. Thank you. So my impression is that we have a clear idea in the room how future mobility should look like. It's smart, it's connected, it's um, high speed, yeah, without any congestion, safe, uh, green, all the things that we have discussed about. What careers do we expect 
uh, in the panel. Why do things look different still today, even though we have been working for a while, for instance, on reducing congestion, yeah, maybe also on, on getting the vehicles uh, greener. So what do we, do we expect? And then taking up your point, um, Katja, yeah, well, what can we learn from each other, yeah, also in, in uh, managing uh, these uh, barriers, yeah, to finally end up where we, my impression is, have a good understanding where we want to go. Do you want to start with this? Yeah, so maybe we are looking at the wrong topics. So we are talking about electric vehicles, we are talking about implementing, implementing public transportation. So that all assumes that we keep on moving at least the same distance than before. But in the end, maybe the main solution is that we move less. Of course, it's quite unpopular. No one really wants it. Policy is, is a little bit skeptical. Um, People don't want that, economy wants growth as well. Um, but it's not necessarily um, a decreasing freedom. And I think the key is a new settlement policy. If we are able to create cities that really reduce traffic, like 15 minute cities that enable people to walk and cycle to reach supermarkets or local pharmacy, then we might have a way bigger impact than switching to electric mobility or to public transportation. I think this is really important to keep in mind and it can only work out together. So mobility plus urban development. And I think this is um, a topic that needs to be addressed by, by all of the countries around the world. Yes, I think um, the one another part that I would like to stress is uh, to do more, right? How, wh I mean, what keeps us where we are? Why why can't we do more? I think uh, we need to be more. We need to be we need to get better in sharing data for research. Um, so, for example, like there are 35 modes of travel uh, that are in the in the city, right? Um, which is the most popular mode? In which region, which mode is taken? I mean, is the popularity evenly distributed, homogeneous across the city, or is it different in different parts? Uh, what is the average travel length in each mode? Now, these are questions that are important to optimize the travel um, dynamics in a city. I cannot answer that because I don't have the data. Someone can go and collect some survey and do the data, but I mean, collect the data, but that data will again become stale after one year or two years, right? Now, of course, it's a challenge to collect all the data across all the modes, but there are certain modes that are digital today, right? For example, there are smart cards that we use for Metro, and similarly, smart cards are going to come in buses and, and, and so on. Uh, can we generate policies so that this data can be shared openly with, with, with researchers who can come up and do the solutions, right? Uh, so I think there is more that we can do from that particular perspective, which can sort of accelerate the research and solutions, ultimately. Uh, and just one more um, answer to Katya's question, like why should we collaborate with Germany versus let's say US or some other countries? Now, US is doing fantastically on technology, Germany is doing fantastically on technology. Why should we collaborate? Because Germany is reaching out to us. I think that's a simple answer to me, right? I am bring, I'm developing connections and I will now collaborate. So I think that just goes a long way in setting up, setting up this, uh, yeah, collaborations across countries, yeah. Yes, uh, I would like to add a uh, few more comments on the, the Jonas, the, just to add to what Jonas said. Uh, regarding that urban planning and the mobility, uh, so during that urban planning we need to uh, see from the EV charging infrastructure perspective also, because it is going to be a subset of the, the larger picture of urban planning. So until and unless we have the uh, network of EV charging, see the faster adoption that government uh, always emphasize the f uh, faster EV adoption is not going to work. So that's why uh, in NCR, in the Delhi NCR region is already a uh, number of charging station is increasing every day as I'm speaking also, it's, it's increasing every day. And uh, there is another part the government is already emphasizing and we have a FAM2, under FAM2 we have a 10,000 crore, which is morely uh, emphasizing on developing the charging infrastructure and we already uh, have a lot of charging infrastructures coming on the expressways and highways and that is already becoming reality and the only thing here is uh, some technical challenges for example like uh, 
uh, the connectors. Uh, the, the, we have a multiple connector, CCS, CCS2, Type 2, Type 1, and the pe people are not aware of this. The uh, information is not shared with the public, but, but even uh, the technical people are confused that uh, which uh, uh, the connector is uh, compatible with, with what, what kind of vehicle segment and so on and so forth. So these are all area of uh, challenge and research that will uh, uh, the research will address in future. Having something like universal uh, uh, charger with a universal connector, you have mobile, you have a C type now. You can look back 10 years ago, the, every company was having a different mobile charger, which doesn't work. One company is, yeah, similar to that, we will be having a, something like a, a common connector or a common uh, charger, which will be compatible for a different category. For example, L category, which is a smaller two-wheeler and three-wheeler, that charger for that category will be common, right? Because uh, their capacity uh, from the propulsion, uh, the electric uh, drive and a motor drive is uh, smaller in uh, uh, size as well as smaller in capacity. Then you, for the M, M category of vehicles, then uh, the common common charger because they will be of little higher performance of vehicles. Then we have then L and M cat category. Then we have uh, uh, that N category is the buses and uh, the passenger. So that's why there will be a universal, I think, uh, charger coming up for different uh, vehicle categories because this L category charger cannot uh, uh, cannot work for the higher category. That will talk. Uh, that will take very long time to get the M category vehicle to charge from the L category charger. So that is how uh, the segregation has to be done, and uh, there should be a, a, a universal uh, charger for its uh, vehicle uh, category. That is how this is one solution. Uh, I think uh, some solution will come in future. I'm very much confident of the all the resources working around in the country. Um, so a, a common problem that we see, for instance, in the build out of wind energy in Germany, but I think it, we can like transform that to also to other infrastructure um, investments is the so-called uh, not in my backyard problem. So if you go around uh, like in Germany and ask people, are you supporting renewable energies? They all say yes. If you ask them, are you supporting that I built a wind farm right in your backyard, they say no. Of course, yeah, I would do also maybe. So I think this um, this relates to participation, and with participation, I'm not speaking about um, you know like um, including people into planning procedures, but users or society society must directly benefit from the diffusion of those uh, new technologies, and not only indirectly through a better environment or less uh, carbon emissions. This is about positive vision. You, you also touched on this, yeah? So um, some, some things uh, that we might need uh, to change uh, are not so sexy, yeah? Um, and how to, uh, how to get these things also done because they are needed, yeah? Uh, to talk about uh, crisis restrictions, yeah? Also for the private modes. Um, reallocating road space, all these things yeah, um, that might be needed, but that are not so attractive compared to new technologies uh, on the ground or even in the air. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, yeah. Hello. This is uh, Hau Saheb from CSR Siri Pilani. Uh, this is very nice uh, discussion going on. It's really inspiring and uh, motivating all of us. I have a uh, very different question. No one is picking on this question. Uh, how would panelists see skill development in this domain? sustainable urban, develop, uh, urban mobility, both in India and Germany, especially to support the failures and maintenance of future mobility devices and infrastructure. We are not speaking on maintenance. We are thinking implement implementing these urban mobilities. However, maintenance is a big challenge. So how do you express your insights on maintenance and failure and 
recording these devices. I see some direct Thank you. energy here, so, <laughs> so we get a direct answer and then we move forward with your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So answer now or yeah, wait for me? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question, relevant, and the I just touched upon that skill deployment during my first uh, the introduction. Yes, we need a huge manpower who are trained in this uh, different stages of uh, implementation as well as uh, uh, post implementation and maintenance, so that we have a longer uh, uh, the the operational life than uh, which will uh, meet our uh, energy target. Uh, regarding that the skill development, uh, I would just like to share a real experiment, uh, the experiment and the, the study that we are doing it and we are also engaging it. Uh, IIP is one of the, uh, you can say, uh, testing agencies and a certified M panel uh, organization under the uh, Ministry of Road Transport and Highways and uh, under the CMBR 126. So uh, the, it is our routine, uh, routine job to train the, uh, the field officers the transport officials from all the Indian states. So we have been doing this for last so many years and uh, we conduct around five to six training programs for uh, every year. So we uh, call representative from the, uh, uh, from the transport department from each and every state. They send to the three representative. So like that we are uh, trying to impart knowledge of the uh, upcoming uh, vehicle technology in that the manner we can uh, expand this skill development, uh, you can say uh, the program, uh, the training program and so forth. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that is how uh, I would put it. And another way is that we also uh, deliver a lot of uh, faculty development program for engineering colleges and for engineering students. There is the other uh, uh, one kind of medium to uh, share the knowledge because without having proper knowledge, I think, uh, uh, this uh, you can say whole implementation program and the the maintenance program uh, may not be so successful as we perceive uh, that is very important so uh, I don't know that uh, how we can expand the uh, the, uh, the skill development to to a level that we can do maybe one million uh, participant in one go or uh, one million participant in six months or something like uh, timeline then target that uh, that's why uh, the our first uh, thinking was that, the transport officials, we are, uh, they are responsible uh, field officers of different states, so we train them first. So they are directly uh, in touch with the public, so that when public comes from the e-mobility or uh, EV perspective for registration or RC or so on and so forth, they are the first one to, uh, you can say, uh, transmit or give the right information. So uh, that is how we are, tra we are trying to make the system smooth for the public. Otherwise, if they are not informed, is going uh, system is not going to smooth uh, have a smooth uh, you can say implementation uh, so that's why we target uh, this uh, field officers first we train them first so anyway as uh, there are a lot of scope for this skill uh, development thank you very much for the relevant answer uh, question and i think this is this needs also clear regulation yeah so maintenance is not as attractive as building new things, yeah, cutting and then saying, wow, yeah, we have an investment and uh, something new, BRT, a public transport, new street design, whatever, compared to just maintenance. So this is also an issue that we um, yeah, need to regulate, I think. Uh, we had uh, one more question here also, and one more there. Uh, one issue which was uh, touched upon by one of the panelists is very, very important. Uh, once we are started uh, relook at urban mobility and sustainability and climate change, it is very important that total overhaul of the urban planning is needed and it may require even many real estate issues and many issues for example, somebody is wanting to come close to his uh, workplace. What does he do? <laughs> you may want it, but uh, there may be uh, prohibitive rental. So some arrangement in the total uh, planning scenario, I think, is required because uh, whatever I mean I'm just mentioning it is endless in for example in NCR 
if somebody starts uh, thinking, I mean, starts from 70s, if we uh, check, we'll find the road has been vibrant, uh, widened five times. It's still, there is complete chaos. So it is an endless process. If we are just substituting the uh, X uh, vehicle with the uh, e, uh, electric vehicle, the road requirement and everything will keep on expanding. It does not end. So sustainability, what sustainability we are talking about? Yeah, no, no, the problem in our uh, country, India, is that we have a large population and some of the urban centers, they are getting more and more crowded. Urban centers are getting more and more crowded. Uh, the NCR may have a, <laughs> I don't know, four crores or more or whatsoever, I don't know. That may not be the full population of some countries. Thank you so much for okay. this question. We take the next one. Okay. So I will start with something very, very basic. So like in the word Indo-German, we see a hyphen. The same hyphen, I will put sustainable hyphen urban mobility. Now I will look at the right side, urban mobility. It's the responsibility of the town planners, the municipality, the government. But sustainability, it's everyone's responsibility. If my postman, my gardener, the sweeper can come on a bicycle or use a public transport. Why can't the VP and the CEOs? The same thing is successful in European countries. Now my question is, what should be the role of academia in bringing that change? Why should we wait for something like COVID to focus on sustainability? Now, to, for urban mobility, sir, happen with sustainability. The sustainability has to start when I am mining lithium not when I am delivering some product. So to bring that mindset shift, what should be the role of academia? Yeah. So this is again the system optimum and the individual optimum, yeah? So <coughs> sustainability looks for the system optimum in the long term, yeah? Uh, with, with fairness also between uh, the different person groups, regions and generations, uh, yeah. So anybody who wants to address directly answer to these two questions? Yeah. I will. I would like to ask to the second co answer to the second question. In India, I know that from third class onwards, we learn about environmental problems. I don't know how is it in Germany. But India is really forward uh, for that, but I am not sure whether we are really following it, right? And also, technology is really running faster than society changes. So we really need something that makes society to move along with technology. As we have already talked here, we need skill development. Along with that, we need also society development, society awareness, and maybe changing the mindset of people. Yeah, this is also something important. And also, no one cares about global, national, or social issues more than his or family issues, right? So whatever comfort for a family, or for a person, they will follow that. What we need to think is that how we can redesign mobility that provides comfort, safety, cost, whatever, that, uh, that overrides the personal mobility. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would like to add to Sir's uh, the command. Uh, sir, frankly speaking, uh, we have around eight lane highways and five lanes, so on and so forth. Uh, first thing is uh, it is a policy matter, I would say, and the second thing is the uh, driving behavior. And the third thing I will say is the uh, we need a lot of awareness program for the public. Public maximum, uh, they are not aware, even the cab drivers, they are not aware of what is the uh, marking on the road, which is the continuous uh, white marking means what? It, they don't know, and uh, there is a, a dotted white marking, they don't know. And uh, uh, what do you call that? This all connected to your policy making. When you go for a, a driving license, you are asked, you, are, you go through a test, then all these traffic symbols and everything is asked. Then after that, uh, what we do it, 
people uh, just to uh, study it to uh, pass the driving test and whatever, then after that normally we don't follow it. This marking and assign, traffic signs are everywhere, but drivers are not aware and they are not uh, a train or I don't know. There has to be some app along with the like Uber and app, uh, Ola does that. Uh, something has to, uh, the whoever goes out of your home, step out of home and taking a vehicle and going that, something has to pop out uh, which is like, uh, like you have in the advanced vehicle, you have other system. The other system, they, they read the, uh, the markings, traffic markings, like if it is 80, then your vehicle reads the 80, then your vehicle brings down to the 80 speed. If it is uh, driven at 100 km per hour, then they read the, uh, the system. So such type of awareness program for the public, the cab drivers and all, this is very much required because 99, I think 95% of the, uh, the people, they are not aware of the, the road marking and the traffic marking. There is one, one thing, and coming back to the uh, driving behavior, it is a huge, very, very big issue in India. It is driving behavior is uh, something to do with the individuals, you know? You cannot detect uh, somebody on road, then uh, you have a road race everywhere, right? Fighting on road. Then why you are coming, cutting this and that. This driving behavior also associated with this all the awareness program and the uh, driving school, right? Then uh, some level of, you can say, we cannot expect in 10 years, we cannot expect uh, like uh, to behave like Europe. So it has to be level one, level two, stage one, stage one. Something like that, uh, a kind of model we have to do it for metros or probably metropolitan cities. Then the, coming back to last one, that uh, the first one I said, the policy matters. Politis, uh, policy matters, uh, it is a very tricky word and uh, it is something uh, like, uh, I don't have any much comment on that. Uh, only thing is that uh, we have to amend, we do, do, do the policy amendment from time to time. The government is doing that. I don't know how fast it is implemented, depends on the reality. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the policy amendment is required, of course, from time to time. That is how uh, we, uh, we are connected with the MRTAs. That's why we have a lot of uh, intermediate meetings and we are part of the Indian B uh, Bureau of Indian Standard and the Automotive industry standard, uh, that, uh, the standardization committee, then we all uh, uh, meet that. So the something policy matter, then uh, uh, it is uh, uh, sometimes it is uh, uh, politically motivated, and uh, sometimes uh, you can say uh, it is a location uh, specific. So uh, government has to look in totality as a country, then uh, uh, this is a uh, overall guideline, then your respective states, uh, can uh, can you can say bend bend a little bit, which is suitable for that particular state. So the central government cannot be uh, well you can say one location uh, bias cannot uh, do that. The, the federal government has to look in totality, looking at the Kerala, looking at Delhi, looking at the south, east, west. They have to look at the totality and the have a, a, a kind of general uh, thing. So yeah, that is how I put it. Uh, so we are about to come to an end and um, our topic is uh, engineering future mobility and we come from our own uh, all different uh, disciplines and we are all researchers uh, on this panel here. So my last question to you is what is your wish uh, for uh, future mobility as a researcher, not as a policy maker yeah, or your advice for what should be done yeah, by policy making, just as a researcher starting with you. Just one line. We do not need a success in car ownership, but we need success in mobility. Um, I, I hope, I mean, see, we are, again, as I said, this is, we are at a time where we are starting, uh, we are, the mobility will change with EVs and all those um, that are coming. So I really hope that the infrastructure this time gets built uh, based on data, based on uh, you know, that can optimize certain scientific objectives and not in a randomized manner. Uh, because then we will keep on playing the catch-up game. How do we improve slightly over there uh, and so on. Let's start from scratch. We are starting from scratch, but now let's do it properly. The infrastructure development, like where to build stations, demand forecasting and so on. This is the data driven computer scientist. Yes, I'm, I'm always thinking from the data perspective.
Yeah, so as an, an energy economist, um, my wish would be that um, we don't see electric vehicles only as electricity demanders, but more as um, what we call a prosumer, so someone that is not only consuming electricity, but also producing or delivering a good, and that is in this case uh, flexibility through the management of the storage uh, uh, for supporting renewable energy integration. So my wish is um, that science is able to communicate what we find out. So people always want easy answers, but the world is quite complex. And I think it's our goal or it's our task to reduce complexity without losing important parts of the answer. Thank you. Uh, I will have only a very simple line. Uh, I wish to have a vehicle where my children and girls, uh, grandchildren, they can enjoy by just uh, putting a bottle of water into the fuel tank and run. <laughs> That's the, my wish, my dream. Thank you. <laughs> but it's still a vehicle, so they should go with your vehicle. So yes, it is uh, best <laughs> something like uh, future uh, hydrogen fuel cell, yes. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you, and thank you too much, uh, so much to all of you. And Thank you so much, all of you. Um, uh, so many float ideas floating here, and I see what all has been discussed in the last 2.5 days as well. There's a nice culmination of all these ideas, and um, great is that the Indian side understands the German side, and the German side understands the Indian side, so I think quite successful integration um, the last day. So thanks a lot. Um, I will hand over now to Katya for a short closing of the day. I think we are in the middle of the discussion, I have to say, coming from the workshop, having a very inspirational uh, fireside chat, seeing a lot of topics which we'll pick up ex uh, actually tomorrow with some experts from the field. So tomorrow morning we kick it off with governance, and this is the field of Jonas, no? he addressed it. And we will look into Cairo, we will look into Delhi, and we will look into Berlin. So I think quite exciting to have experts talking ab exactly about these aspects of urban planning. Then we're going to have two parallel sessions. We will discuss integrated models, that's what Hannes raised, looking at integrating modeling um, data is in, something for Cyan. Uh, we have experts who do huge data integration, the MOST project from Germany, DLR, but also from India, to look how one can integrate existing data and transfer it into models, so a bit more fundamental research. We will also look into new business model, energy markets, and actually Hannes Hobby is going to moderate the session, and there we're gonna have not just an Indian and German presentation, but also somebody from Sweden who will contribute this perspective. We will look into societal aspects in the afternoon and talk about um, technology adaptation and diffusion. I think that's the human-centric perspective, which we heard also, no? We've learned we should not let technology drive us. We've learned that we should drive technology uh, but how we adapt also these uh, methodologies and participation was in the panel also what I've, I've heard. So we look into that in the, in the panel. We look at it from an AI perspective. And last but not least, um, we will look uh, into AI and how artificial intelligence, where India and Germany have new strategies up, will help in driving the sustainable urban mobility, but also the energy transition forward. So I'm quite excited. Tomorrow, it's uh, you can do it from your desk. It's a bit easier. You don't have to travel here to Clarishes, but I would also greet the audience who is there on the live stream uh, and thank for participating uh, and listening to the panel. I think we can continue the discussions. I've heard there are more questions. I would invite you outside at the pool for a nice evening with some snacks, foods, and drinks to continue the discussion with all the participants here in the room and tomorrow we start at which time, Adishri? 2 p.m. online, 2 p.m. Indian Standard Time and for those who are on the online stream connected to Germany, this is gonna be then 9.30 if I calculate it correctly. So have a nice evening, looking forward to discuss with you. Thanks to the panelists again and yeah, looking forward to see you outside. Enjoy the evening. <laughs>